The uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming is called to order, uh, and uh, we thank everyone for uh, being here. Uh, every day the news is filled with the stories of how $4 a gallon gasoline hurts working people in this country. Every day we hear of some new societal impact, some new economic problem, some new forecast of even higher prices yet to come. The skyrocketing price of gas at the pump hits consumers all over the country. And high oil prices also send a shock wave through our economy that hurts businesses and threatens to inflate prices. Most experts do not believe that these prices will come down anytime soon. We are here today to discuss solutions to this latest energy crisis, because 70 percent of oil goes into transportation. Any solutions to the oil crisis must focus on the transportation sector. The Bush administration argues that we can drill our way out of this crisis. This is wrong. Forty-five percent of the world's oil is located in Iraq, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. And almost two-thirds of known oil reserves are in the Middle East. The United States is home to less than 3 percent of the world's oil reserves, but we consume 25 percent of the world's oil. 60 percent of the oil that we use every day comes from overseas at an annual cost of hundreds of billions of dollars, much of which ends up in the hands of countries hostile to our interests. Even if we open the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and the Atlantic and Pacific coastlines to drilling today, the Energy Department reports that the first drops of oil would not hit consumers' gas tanks for 10 years. Peak production would not occur until 2030. And even then, there would be no significant impact on prices at the pump. America's strength lies not in the size of its oil reserves, but in our superior technological might. Our biggest single step we have taken to curb our oil dependence is to raise the fuel economy standards of our automotive fleet. When CAFE was first passed in the mid-1970s in response to the first oil crisis, imported oil fell as a percentage of total consumption in the United States from 47 percent in 1977 to 27 percent in 1985. And last December, after my efforts in 2001 and 2003 in 2005 and 2006 were blocked, Congress passed the first mandated increase in fuel economy standards since 1975, requiring that the fleet of cars and light trucks average at least 35 miles per gallon by 2020. This will save at least 2.5 million barrels of oil per day uh, by the year 2030 when our entire fleet will have turned over and will save consumers billions of dollars in gasoline they will not have to buy. Today, the Department of Transportation, charged with implementing the energy bill, will discuss its proposal to increase the fleet fuel economy average to 31.6 miles per gallon by 2015. A major flaw in its analysis is that it uses outdated energy information agency assumptions about gas prices that simply defy reality. At a time when gasoline prices are soaring well above $4 per gallon, almost a dollar more uh, than when we passed the energy bill just in December, NHTSA and the Energy Information Agency, that is the Department of Transportation and the Department of Energy, mid-range forecasts for gasoline prices that range from $2.42 a gallon in 2016 to $2.51 a gallon in 2030. When compared to today's prices at the pump, these numbers are nothing short of absurd, especially absurd in terms of what we should be planning for as a country technologically in terms of the vehicles which we drive. Buried at the back of its very long technical analysis, NHTSA documents the results of using EIA's high price gasoline projection of $3.14 in 2016 and to $3.74 a gallon in 2030, and found that technology is available to cost-effectively achieve a much higher fleet-wide fuel economy of nearly 35 miles per gallon by 2015. On June 11, Guy Caruso, Administrator of the Energy Information Agency, told this committee 
that he agreed that NHTSA should use EIA's high gas price scenario in setting its final fuel economy standards. I agree and have been joined by dozens of my colleagues today in sending a letter encouraging the Department of Transportation to do so. I look forward to hearing the Department's views on this and other aspects of its proposal. We are also fortunate today to have with us some participants in the next generation of automotive technology development. Making cars and like trucks use less oil is enormously important, but ultimately to address our energy security and global warming challenges, we will need to develop vehicles that use no oil at all. Our second panel of witnesses will show us one way of getting to that better place. I thank you all for coming here today. Uh, and now I turn and recognize the ranking member uh, of the uh, Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, your opening comments have inspired me so much that rather than reading off the prepared statement that the staff has prepared for me to say, I'm going to ask unanimous consent to put it in the record and I'll respond to my friend the chairman extemporaneously. Without objection. The topic of this hearing, $4 gasoline and fuel economy, I think is symptomatic of why we've got a big problem in this country. We have $4 gallon gasoline today uh, because we have deliberately not exploited our domestic resources. And while I'm the first to say that we can't drill our way out of high gas prices, locking up all of our domestic resources and not wanting to drill practically anywhere where it is economically feasible uh, has contributed to the high gas prices. And while it will probably take 10 to 20 years for us to fully benefit from uh, drilling in the Outer Continental Shelf and in other places, had we started that 10 or 20 years ago, maybe we wouldn't be in the pickle that we're in today and our constituents and consumers are uh, having to suffer uh, the cost of the high gas prices. Now, overlaying all of this is the increase in uh, the CAFE standards that the chairman is very proud of. Uh, listening to what he said today when uh, CAFE was first passed in 1975, uh, we saw a huge decrease in the percentage of imported oil. Well, what's happened is that we passed CAFE, the percentage of imported oil has gone up, and meantime, the majority party two or three times has passed legislation that actually repeals the domestic production tax credit uh, for developing domestic resources, uh, which makes it cheaper for the oil companies to buy more oil overseas. Now, the result of all of this is starting to show up in lost jobs and lost good paying jobs. The major employer in Janesville, Wisconsin is General Motors. They make SUVs there. There are highly skilled, highly paid members of the United Auto Workers that will be losing their jobs between now and 2010 because GM has decided that the market is not going to uh, support uh, having a full-fledged production facility uh, for SUV vehicles, which are made in Janesville, Wisconsin. And all of these people are going to lose their jobs. And they're going to lose their jobs because of the short-sightedness of people who say we can't drill, we ought to increase taxes on domestic production of oil, we ought to raise CAFE standards so that uh, these types of vehicles cannot meet them and effectively are legislating themselves out of the market. And this is the type of attitude where con people go around saying Congress knows best and we know what's good for you rather than you know what's good for yourself in deciding how you are going to spend your dollars. Now, I guess I'm particularly disturbed given what's happened in Wisconsin with a big GM plant closing and a lot of UAW members being thrown out of work. With all due respect to my colleague from Nashville, Ms. Blackburn, that we invite somebody from Nissan here to talk about this. Nissan's a Japanese company. And it seems to me if we want to keep production in the United States 
and we want those profits to be repatri repatriated in the United States rather than being sent to a foreign country, we ought to be working with General Motors and Chrysler and with Ford uh, to developing solutions rather than providing a forum for uh, a representative of a Japanese company. Now, there are all kinds of solutions that are on the table. Um, one of the solutions that we have been discussing in this committee is cap and tax. And that's what it is, because it will be a tax on uh, fossil fuel energy production, whether it is electricity, whether it is gasoline, or whether it is natural gas. There have been several economic studies that the Lieberman Warner and the Markey bills which impose a cap and tax regime will increase the cost of gasoline by 150 percent, plus or minus. That's a $10 a gallon uh, cost for gas, and that's assuming that there is no inflation uh, that will take place over the period of time that the study runs. If we all think our constituents are having a bad time at $4 a gallon gas, imagine the consequences of $10 a gallon gas. Uh, because raising the price of gas is a regressive way of raising money, whether it is through cap and tax or whether it is through market economics. So the solution that's being proposed on the other side is unacceptable. It is one that will really dislocate the American economy, and particularly poor people who have to commute to go to and from work. These are bad solutions. And no wonder the United Auto Workers and the United Mine Workers have come out against both the Lieberman-Warner bill and the Markey bill, uh, which will effectively put their businesses and their workers, who are mostly Democratic voters, I might add, out of jobs and out of business. So let's start using market economics uh, rather than uh, having hearings complaining about $4 a gallon gas, because what's being proposed on the other side is going to raise that 150 percent. I yield back. Uh, recognize himself um, for five minutes. I think this discussion we're having is obviously healthy with the pickle we're in, and I think there are two fundamental uh, different routes that we are discussing. One is a route where we remain ex uh, addicted exclusively to oil for our transportation purposes, and we do not use the scientific te technological advances for efficiency in making them efficient. That is the status quo route, and it is one largely advocated by many of my colleagues across the aisle. The alternative route is to be one that looks to give Americans alternatives to oil so that we can once and for all break the addiction to oil that we suffer from and the monopoly we have for the oil and gas industry when we pull up to the pump. And while we're doing that, we use the new scientific technolo technologies to make our cars that do run on oil, which are going to do for decades because that is the dominant fuel force and will, uh, will be for a decade or two, uh, that we use cars that are most efficient. That is the fundamental two tracks that we were on. I would want to suggest the second track is the is the preferred one for two reasons. One, if you look at what can actually deliver for the American people. We know one thing cannot deliver, and we know one thing that can deliver. We know one thing that cannot deliver, which is relying exclusively on domestic drilling. The reason we know that is that the dinosaurs, for reason that escape all of us, decided to go die under somebody else's sand. The oil is not here. There are more dinosaur theme parks as a percentage of theme parks in the world than there are oil reserves in our domestic country relative to world oil reserves. Now, this isn't a theory or a hypothesis or democratic communist thought. It is a simple fact of geology. We have 25 percent of the world's usage, and we have 3 percent or less of all the reserves. If you drill, this is according to George Bush's administration. If you drill in Yellowstone, Mount Rainier, and the South Lawn of the White House, you will not increase world oil reserves by more than 1 percent, and it will take you a decade to do it. That route is doomed to failure to have any significant restraint on oil prices, any significant increase in our oil independence, or any reduction of global uh, warming gases. There is another route. 
that is capable of success. The first is to do the obvious things, which are to manufacture cars that, you, that use existing oil drivetrains that are more efficient. I talked to Jimmy Carter a couple years ago about this, and he pointed out something I thought was kind of interesting. Talk about lost opportunities. If we had simply continued the rate of increase of gas mileage we were having from 1976 to 1982, if we simply had continued the path we were on, we would be free of Saudi Arabia oil today. Now, if we would have drilled in Mount Rainier National Park and the South Lawn and the White House, we would still be addicted to Saudi Arabia oil today. But if we had simply had CAFE standards during that period of time, we would have been free from Saudi Arabia oil today. Uh, that's number one. But second and more importantly, and we'll hear some testimony from Shai Agassi and others here today about the possibilities and I believe probabilities that within the next day or two, decade or two, Americans will be freed from the addiction to oil with the new technologies. Anybody want to know this and question me, go up to, uh, to Waterton, Massachusetts and talk to the A123 battery company that I did that's going to provide the battery for the Chevrolet Volt. And if anybody doesn't think Chevrolet is serious about that, uh, read the article in Atlantic Monthly. And if anybody doesn't think there's advanced biofuels that are possible in this, go talk to the venture capitalists that just put $50 million into the Sapphire Energy Company to produce gasoline, ATSM certified gasoline from algae without feeding it any sugar whatsoever, simply using photosynthesis. So we simply suggest on this side that when President Bush said two years ago in a stunning statement for a Texas oil man, he said, we are addicted to oil. It was good for him to say that. It was not so hot when last week he came out and said, and my fellow citizens, since we are addicted to oil, let's get more addicted. Let's go back and ask the pusher for just one more needle, and that's going to solve our problem. We think bolder on this side of this aisle. We think a bolder vision that ought to break this monopoly and give Americans a choice. When we do that, prices are going to come down and we're going to be more secure, and we're going to have a chance to beat global warming. That's the future we ought to have. I yield back whatever chance. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, delighted to be here at this hearing as we uh, talk about how we implement the fuel economy standards or examine the recently proposed CAFE standards uh, proposed by NHTSA. And I certainly look forward to hearing from our uh, panel. In fact, I principally sat a, uh, sought a seat on this committee because I wanted to be a very strong advocate for the domestic auto industry, obviously in full disclosure, being from Michigan. Uh, and I think we should just take a moment to consider the entire history of this cornerstone industry and really what it has meant for our nation as well. In fact, during World War II, Southeast Michigan was actually known as the arsenal of democracy because we had the manufacturing capability uh, that literally uh, built the armaments that led the world to peace, uh, I believe, kept our nation free. Uh, in fact, there were two years uh, th during that time when the domestic autos didn't even build cars because they were so bu busy building airplanes and jeeps, uh, tanks. We were fully engaged uh, in the war effort, protecting freedom and liberty and democracy. In fact, the domestic auto industry, I believe, absolutely helped to create and, and in fact, did create the middle class in states like mine and Michigan and, and others as well. And then after 9-11, let's not forget that the domestic autos immediately offered zero interest financing, which kept the plants running and people kept buying cars and our citizens uh, were employed so that our national economy did not uh, implode uh, as the terrorists uh, had hoped. And yet, in spite of this very proud history of the domestic auto industry, it seems sometimes to us in Michigan and other uh, areas that hosted domestic autos, and many in this Congress seem to be focused on bankrupting the domestic auto industry and losing American jobs. And now, of course, Congress has passed and the President has signed what amounts to an $85 billion mandate on the domestic autos. Now, that is $85 billion now that is mandated on this industry in an industry that is absolutely, literally struggling to survive right now. And this is money that has to be spent by the big three over the next decade just to achieve the mandate that has been set forth in the law. And as has been mentioned uh, uh, already, uh, the CAFE standards were set in place in 1973, and they have not only devastated the American uh, auto manufacturers, but they really have done nothing. Most importantly, they have done nothing to dec decrease our nation's dependence on foreign oil. When they were first established, the CAFE standards, the uh, U.S. relied on about 30 percent 
uh, of our uh, imported, uh, about 30 percent of our uh, uh, oil was imported from foreign sources. And now that closer, that number is closer to 60 percent. So I'm not sure that anyone could really say with a straight face that Congress has helped here. And for the past 30 years, critics of the domestic auto industry have put forth CAFE as the simple solution to limit America's demand for foreign sources of oil. And I think all CAFE has really done is put the brakes on innovation because we agree that we have to get off of oil. But we should be, I think as a government in, in, a, in a nation, incentivizing the domestic auto industry rather than slapping them with mandates that cost literally hundreds of billions of dollars to comply with. I think we should be encouraging them uh, to invest in new technologies such as the uh, lithium ion battery and other biodiesels rather than mandating expenditures on what is very, very old and antiquated technology, and I think it is stifling American innovation. Uh, and as has been mentioned, we will be hearing from a Japanese company. I think it is of note that the Japanese uh, government actually spends uh, a lot of money on incentivizing uh, their companies, uh, not only their, uh, for their automobiles, but for their electronics, for everything with lithium ion batteries and R&D strategies and these kinds of things. Instead, we expect uh, our industries to uh, shoulder all of that on itself while we continue to mandate, uh, as I say, for very old technology. Again, I thank the Chairman for calling the uh, hearing. I certainly uh, look forward to hearing from all the witnesses. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I regret that the, uh, my colleague from uh, Michigan feels that some of us on this side of the aisle are, are uh, out to get the uh, uh, American domestic auto industry. I, myself, I drive a, uh, a uh, Mercury Mariner hybrid and my wife drives a Chevrolet. And uh, I could have gotten better mileage had I gone for a Prius. Uh, there would have been a little bit of a waiting time involved. In fact, uh, I understand from the literature before us that the average time a Prius spends on the lot is 17 hours uh, right now. They sell as quick as they can make them. You know, some of the problem here um, is, uh, unfortunately, that the CEOs and the executives of the auto industries didn't talk to their workers. I know that by talking to the workers myself. Uh, and had they done so, they might have known uh, not to concentrate so much on big, heavy vehicles where they're uh, profit margin was maybe a little bit bigger and advertised such ridiculous things as driving an SUV up to the top of a mountain and playing Frisbee across to another mountain top and then, you know, showing that this four-wheeler could, uh, uh, could do that and advertising power to this day, to this day, power and speed. When I've watched TV and see the advertising that's going on, it's, it's starting to change. But, um, you know, I think that you can't judge the, the recent CAFE standard increase that was signed into law, that we passed and was signed into law just last December, and it is not supposed to fully take effect 2020. You certainly can't blame that for the gas prices of today. I think what you can blame is the lack of doing anything like that for the last 32 years. Um, sometimes government needs to act to try to help the national interest when market forces or corporate interests don't do so when they, when they diverge from the national interest. And I, I think the same goes with, uh, with oil. The ranking member uh, was talking about uh, the need to open up land for drilling. Well, we've got 68 million acres of land, uh, mostly public land, that's open on national uh, lands uh, onshore and offshore, uh, leased already by the oil companies, environmental studies done, ready for a drill bit to go into the ground, and they're not doing it. Uh, why? Uh, at the same time, asking us to open up more land and open up the uh, Arctic Preserve and so on. Uh, I would prefer to see those 68 million acres drilled on, but I suspect the reason that they're not being drilled on is because the oil is worth more left in the ground. So once again, it may be necessary for government to do something like the use it or lose it proposal, which we th I think we'll be discussing uh, later this week, uh, to change the interest and to incentivize the oil companies to actually pump oil out of lands they've already acquired the rights to. Uh, I'll enter my written statement into the record and, and yield back. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What a feisty discussion we're having through our opening statements today. And uh, I want to thank you for the hearing. I want to welcome all of our witnesses. We are delighted that you are here and we are looking forward 
to hearing from you as we work on the issue of gas prices in the auto issue industry. And I want to particularly introduce a member of the second panel, Mr. Thorman, who is from Nissan North America and is one of my constituents and is one of our very proud Tennessee companies. And we are delighted that he is here. We also know that, and I hope he's going to talk a little bit today about the innovation that is being done on electric cars and good work that is being done by American engineers who are located in my district, who are finding answers to all of these questions that obviously past Congresses have felt were insurmountable. You can go back to the Jimmy Carter era and go back to 77 and look at what started happening with the EPA. You can go in and look in the 90s when Clinton vetoed drilling in Anwar and uh, Vice President Gore decided that the EPA needed to have even more uh, ability to restrict American supply and focus on those items from the past. Today, let's put our attention on what American innovation are doing to solve this problem and some of the work that is taking place with electric vehicles and I hope that my colleagues will join me and say if we're going to do this if this is going to be an option then it behooves Congress to take a serious look with how we improve the electric power grid in this nation are we going to consider nuclear which works well in my area what are we going to see happen in other areas? This is not a time for bickering. It is a time for action. We are going to have a panel before us who can help address this. I hope that we will, uh, we will welcome them, that we will listen attentively, and that we will put our focus on solving this problem. And I yell back. Uh, thank you. Uh we will start with our witnesses. Tyler Duvall is Assistant Secretary for Transportation Policy and Acting Undersecretary for Policy at the United States Department of Transportation. Uh, he's been working in the development of transportation policies, held the title for past two years. He's a business and finance associate for four years at Hogan and Hartson, and he has a BA in economics from Washington Lee University, JD from University of Virginia. Mr. Duvall, thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to appear before you to discuss the Department's uh, proposal to substantially increase fuel economy standards. Uh, to my right is uh, Steve Kratzky, who is one of the leading experts on fuel economy in the United States, uh, technical expert and available for uh, in-the-weeds questioning. Uh, a key component of the President's 2010 proposal was a significant increase in fuel economy standards for cars and light trucks. By increasing standards beginning in model year 2010 for cars and in model year 2012 for light trucks, the President's aggressive proposal was projected to save up to 8.5 billion gallons of gasoline in 2017 alone and reduce consumption by 5 percent. Through the leadership of many of you uh, on this committee, Congress opened the way last December to further increases in those standards, including in the car standards, when it enacted the Energy Information and Security Act. That legislation provided the framework for the first meaningful increases in fuel economy standards in decades. The proposed standards would increase fuel economy 4.5 percent per year over the five-year period ending in 20, 2015. This rate substantially exceeds not only the 3.3 percent needed on average to meet the 35 mile per gallon minimum established by Congress last year, but also the 4 percent per year increase called for in the President's 2010 proposal. We estimate achieving these levels of fuel economy would require nearly $50 billion of investments in fuel saving technologies through 2015. These standards are tough, but achievable and necessary. All told, the proposal will save nearly 55 billion gallons of fuel and a reduction in carbon dioxide emissions estimated at 521 million metric tons over the life of the affected vehicles. In addition to the rulemaking, the Department delivered to EPA about an hour ago a draft environmental impact statement. We expect that that, that statement will be published by EPA on July 3rd. I have a copy here uh, for the record and available for public comment. In the meantime, it will be on our website. And Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the copy of the EIS, uh, as I said, will be uh, submitted for the record uh, right now. The comment period on our proposal will end next week. We will carefully analyze all of the comments and expect to issue a final decision this year, less than one year after the en enactment of the EISA. This will be an accomplishment in which we can all take credit and pride, and I would be pleased to answer any questions on the rulemaking. Thank you. Would your colleague like to add anything? He's certainly welcome to. Thank you. The chair will recognize uh, himself for five minutes. 
Uh, first off, this may be clear to everyone, but I do want to make sure uh, we are all on the same page. The, the recently enacted bill, r it was billed as a 35 miles per hour standard, but it actually was more than that. It required the, 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 the um, maximum feasible rate to be achieved every year. Is, it, is that right? Yeah, the, the law, uh, EPCA, uh, requires uh, basically max feasible, and that was not changed in this law. So uh, I want to ask, I want to focus on fuel costs in your, um, in your modeling and, and assumptions regarding new technology. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, in, in your assumptions, what percentage of the U.S. automobile fleet does your agency believe is reasonably attainable by the year of, let's say, uh, 2015 to be electric propulsion, or at least, at least partially electric propulsion? Uh, Congressman, we did not estimate in the uh, rulemaking proposal percentage of uh, electrified vehicles. Obviously, the product plans that were submitted to us by the auto manufacturers included uh, a percentage of, of hybrid vehicles. Uh, I'm not sure, Steve, if we made, made that information public in the – these are confidential product plans, so I do not believe we published the precise uh, automakers' uh, decisions with respect to hybrid vehicles. Is that right? That's well, it, it, I, that caused me a little concern. I'll tell you why. We got cars driving out around the country today, and I've driven one gets 150 miles per gallon because it's a plug-in hybrid electric car. And these are not sort of hypothetical vehicles; they're real vehicles. You can buy one today from various vendors in the United States. Right. Chevrolet certainly intends one to have on the road by 2010 or, or 2011. Now. Is it your understanding that you simply, in your decision making, let the automakers tell you how many electric vehicles are going to be on the road, or don't you think it's the federal government's uh, obligation under this bill to say, look, we have this technology available. Our obligation is to figure out what's maximally achievable, what's feasible. It's clearly feasible to do this. Why are we not setting a goal for 2015 and what percentage of cars are going to be plug-in hybrids, for instance, not even forgetting for the moment full electric vehicles? Right. Uh, good question, Congressman. The, the, the way the, uh, the rule works and the structure of the rule uh, uh, is a basically a, an input-output model in which basically the uh, array of technologies, including hybrid technologies, which is, uh, I think, the most expensive technology that could be applied, but there's a whole range and suite of technologies, uh, lower cost th th than hybrids, that get applied uh, basically directly to the automobiles through the model. And we take the product plans that are submitted to us from the automobile companies who do not submit substantial uh, uh, numbers of, of plug-in hybrids. Th uh, I will say uh, that those product plans are going to be updated uh, very soon, right after the close of the comment well, period. I, I have to tell you, I, this is just satisf not satisfactory to me. It's our job to decide what's maximally feasible, not the producers. We've been following their lead, frankly, for 30 years, and we've fallen way behind the world in technology as a result. We have this known technology. We know it's technologically feasible. We know it's economically feasible. It's just a question of how fast to get it to market. Now, when I voted for that bill, I was under the understanding that the federal government, Uncle Sam, protecting consumers, would be start making some decisions. And if we have a technically feasible electrical vehicle, why should we not expect our federal agency to be a to be assessing what percentage can be part of the fleet by what certain date using the best available evidence. I have no objection to receiving evidence from the, the, the geniuses, in the, and they are geniuses in this industry, but isn't it our job, don't you think it should be our job, to be a little more aggressive in that regard? Again, the, the, the way the rule is structured, we do not mandate specific technologies. What we do is apply technologies based on their costs, and at, at the point in which the cost of applying those technologies exceeds the benefit largely in the form of fuel savings, uh, the model basically determines that it's no longer cost beneficial to society to right. continue and to so force technology. So that's my technology. next question. What fuel, what assumption did you make what fuel costs in deciding whether a plug-in hybrid should be produced or not? Th there's a range of, uh, uh, we use the base case, the average case, uh, EIA forecast, uh, as was noted in the ch chairman's opening statement, uh, obviously out uh, through uh, 2015. Uh, those prices, uh, as was in, were indicated, uh, appear to be somewhat off of, of current prices. How much? Why don't you tell us what they are? The 242 in 2015, and that's, con that's the EIA forecast uh, for 2015. Well, you know, we hope to do some things to bring it down with our anti-excessive speculation bills we passed today, but that really appears to be, and I think to most of my constituents paying 415 at the pump, kind of silly. Well, I, I would making say making a major federal policy on the assumption in 2015 gas is going to cost 242 a gallon. 
with the emerging Chinese economy, the lack, uh, uh, isn't that kind of a silly number to use? Uh, not, not at all, uh, Congressman. I think, as, as you noted, uh, long-term uh, oil prices obviously are inherently uncertain. Uh, and I think, uh, as you noted, a number of, of, of people are talking about the a potential that speculation is driving up prices. Obviously, there is an internal inconsistency to argue on the one hand that speculation is driving up prices, but that long-run prices uh, should be significantly lower. We are dealing in, an, in an, obviously an extremely volatile oil price environment currently. Uh, this is a long-term policy, however. Uh, we have taken comment on that exact question in the rulemaking, however, and if we receive substantial comments and if EIA updates its uh, uh, oil price forecast, we will obviously take that into consideration in the Well, I would like to provide you a comment right now, if I may. It is ridiculous to assume price is going to be 242 a gallon in the year 2015, number one. And number two, I believe it is Uncle Sam's responsibility to, to use a reasonable gas price. And if you use a reasonable gas price, plug in and full electric vehicles are going to be imminently economically feasible within just a few years. And it is your job to be making that decision, and I hope you will do so. With that, I will uh, uh, yield to Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, I appreciate the witnesses uh, being here today. Let me just ask you, gentlemen, what is your opinion of how CAFE standards have worked since the 1970s, since there seems to be some disagreement up here? Are you willing to uh, bite on that one? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Congressman, we are. The, uh, we think, obviously, there were some significant structural problems with the model uh, for doing fuel economy requirements uh, in previous years, and we believe we corrected that in 2006 with the light truck standard using an attribute-based system. Uh, we re greatly appreciated that the Congress recognized the merits of that approach, which uh, treats all manufacturers equally, recognizes that consumers have diverse preferences, and also recognizes the safety risks associated with a flat standard that will uh, provide incentives for automaker, uh, auto manufacturers not to deploy technologies but simply to make lighter vehicles, which are, are more of a safety hazard. We believe the current approach proposed in the last rulemaking, which builds on the 2006 model, was a substantial improvement and remedied many of the failures I just talked about. Uh, if I understood what you just said, you are looking to apply uh, uniformity across the industry uh, with the new CAFE standards, with the, model, the modeling uh, that you are using right now. It is a size-based standard, so we take the product plans provided to us by the manufacturers, uh, apply that into a model uh, which produces a curve. Uh, on the left-hand side of the curve is a smaller footprint vehicle. On the right-hand side of the curve is a larger footprint vehicle. For the larger footprint vehicles, obviously, the, the corresponding fuel economy requirements are different. Uh, basically, the rule's intent is to recognize the diverse product mix that our car makers have across the globe, not just in the U.S., and to really drive technologies across the board as opposed to the, I think, the previous approach that, that you are talking about really uh, did not drive technologies efficiently and, and, and had a potentially uh, serious safety impact if pursued aggressively. Well, I am looking forward to hearing the, uh, the next panel, particularly the fellow from uh, Nissan, and I appreciate uh, the American jobs that they provide, but it has been said that the uh, that uh, Nissan requested and received a special interest exemption during the cafe uh, uh, standards, a sort of a loophole in the in the law that allows them to combine their domestic and import car fleets uh, through 2013. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not going to characterize it as a loophole. There is a special provision, obviously, that impacts uh, Nissan related to the combination of, of those fleets. Yes. Now, how did that happen? And and do you believe that that is fair? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how it happened. I uh, was not up here, obviously, uh, when the bill was being written. Uh, and as far as fairness, uh, obviously, the law it was signed by the President and passed by the Congress, and we're going to implement it. Well, I think it's uh, good for them, I guess, that they were able to get that. But I think it would have been uh, fair to have uh, all everybody in the industry, both domestic and foreign, all treated uh, equally. And uh, but I, I just point that out. I think that's uh, something of note. Um, the model that uh, or the, the proposed uh, your, in your notice of rulemaking that you sent out in uh, in April there your proposed standards uh, as, as we looked at it are essentially resulting in an increase I believe uh, of the cafe standards about 17 percent uh, and you heard me say in my opening statement we thought that that was uh, yeah I'm not sure of that so I guess it's part of my question we we're just sort of trying to figure out here in the office before I came over what what is the percentage of increase actually in this but. You know, dollar-wise, you heard me say in my opening statement, we think it interpolates to uh, $85 billion on the domestic autos, and uh, that is not a number that came out of my office. It's uh, some of the some of the uh, fellows from the domestic autos have been saying that. 
Uh, do you think the 17 percent is somewhere in the ballpark? And what about the 85 billion dollar mandate? When you when you're doing your model, do you take into consideration uh, job loss or the uh, uh, economics that you're uh, foisting on a uh, on an industry and a, and a state in particular? Uh, Congresswoman, I think our estimate is that it's approximately a 25 percent increase uh, over the time period. The, the overall statute requires by 2020 a 35 MPG uh, standard across the board for trucks and light cars, and we have uh, put, put forward a proposal that exceeds that pace by, by uh, a decent margin, but not uh, too much in our view. Uh, as far as total costs, we estimate basically across the board, not with respect to U.S. companies or, or non-U.S. companies, a $46.74 billion uh, impact, which is uh, among the most expensive rulemakings ever uh, completed in the federal government's history. Uh, it's an extremely aggressive proposal. Uh, we are very cognizant of the impacts of this proposal on the industry. Uh, it's, the benefits of the proposal from a societal perspective do, uh, do exceed those. Uh, basically on a benefit cost ratio of about I think 1.5 to 1.6. So from a societal perspective, the rulemaking uh, makes a lot of sense, but we are extremely aware of the impacts on, on various manufacturers. I think the attribute based system, as I indicated previously, is a is an extremely important element of the fairness of this proposal. Uh, and the distribution of costs is far more fair and efficient, frankly, from an economics perspective than would have been done under a flat standard increase. I appreciate that. I guess my final question would be then, uh, have you interpolated how much the special exemption for uh, Nissan is saving that company over the others? Uh, no, we have not estimated that, Congressman. Will that be part of your uh, uh, work as well? Uh, I do not believe we are going to uh, estimate that, but I, I'll, I'll check with our technical folks on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I. Uh, <coughs> I sympathize with my colleagues' uh, concern about uh, a level playing field for American uh, manufacturers and uh, those that are owned by, uh, by foreign companies. I, I also have to say that as somebody who never got any uh, subsidies or um, incentives or uh, uh, grants from the government to start a small business and to try to produce a product. Uh, that the public would buy, in my case it happened to be music, uh, it certainly is a long shot and it was my judgment or lack thereof that made some records that I made successful and some records that I made dogs <laughs> that sold only a few copies and disappeared into the, the cutout <laughs> bins rather quickly. Uh, so they're all downloads now, they're not records. But anyway, <laughs> my point is that um, I've read recently that uh, GM and Ford have been, w even as they're cutting back on the uh, manufacturing of the uh, SUVs and light trucks, that they've had to add shifts for some of their smaller cars because the demand has moved in that direction. So I would just suggest that perhaps better management uh, would have foreseen that coming. And that it's the kind of thing that, you know, it's hard to hear when it's your district and or your company. And it was hard for me to hear from people when I was being told why my record wasn't a hit. But I, uh, <laughs> uh, I do think that there's a, a, a factor here regarding how many millions of dollars it uh, costs uh, or how many billions or millions of dollars it would have cost to tool up for hybrids or for fuel efficient cars 10 years ago or 20 years ago and not be in the situation now of having to ha have it uh, legislated. But. Uh, when President Kennedy issued his challenge to us as a country to go to the moon, he didn't have NASA run a feasibility study on that goal. He just set an example of government setting a seemingly impossible mark and challenging the country to meet it, which is what we need to do here for our family budgets, for our economy, and for our national security. Um, and I, I thank you for your testimony. Uh, I wanted to ask in predicting uh, Feasibility, technological fe feasibility, is NHTSA attempting to factor in the potential market impact of plug-in hybrids like the Chevy Volt or other models that may be available or other batteries that may be on the verge of uh, coming into play, including some that I'm aware of that are orders of magnitude more efficient and hold that much deeper a charge than those in use today. Right, Congressman. There's, a, there's little question uh, in our view that there's enormous progress uh, with respect to battery technologies and, and plug-in hybrids. Uh, as I said to, to the, the uh, then chairman, uh, the, uh, 
the, the structure of the rule basically takes the cost of all these technologies, and, and the technologies you've cited are obviously extremely expensive technologies, but produce potentially enormous benefits if they can be commercialized successfully, uh, and inputs those into a model which basically says that at some point it is not cost beneficial to society to apply a technology whose costs pr produce uh, fewer uh, amounts of fuel savings in, in dollar, in basically in dollar terms. And so at some point it doesn't make sense to impose costs on manufacturers if the fuel savings that are produced from those cost requirements uh, do not produce uh, obviously uh, uh, benefits equivalent to the cost. So it's a, it's a marginal cost, marginal benefit analysis. Now as these technologies develop over coming years and as we absorb additional product plans, which is what we will do here soon, uh, very soon actually for the next round of product plans, it's important to note that the product plans we utilized for this NPRM were 2007 product plans. Uh, the next round of product plans may, may include precisely the types of technologies you're talking about, and those will then be included in the rulemaking. Thank you so much. I only have a little bit of time, so let me ask you a couple of quick questions. Uh, uh, GM and Ford both have been making flex fuel vehicles, E85 compatible mm -hmm. uh, vehicles, and there are a couple hundred thousand of them on the roads in my state of New York. However, there are only a few uh, stations that carry E85 and none in my district. Uh, West Point has just agreed to put in uh, a 5,000 gallon tank for their motor pool and the, and the uh, uh, commissary so that their concentrated uh, population that buys a lot of product can get some flowing through the pipeline. But uh, does uh, the administration have uh, an opinion on whether uh, something should be done or perhaps something sh needs to be legislated or ru a rule made so that uh, these uh, alternative or biofuel mixes mm -hmm. can be made available since the cars are being sold ostensibly for that purpose. Yeah, Congressman, actually the, the administration and the President pushed extremely hard in the energy bill to, to not only increase the, the fuel economy requirements under our NPRM, but also uh, for an alternative energy mandate uh, that will see a huge increase uh, in uh, ethanol-powered vehicles in the United States. So we have the push on the production side through the mandate uh, included in, uh, in the December Act, and then on our side we have a huge push uh, of technology requirements and obviously incentives through the structure of CAFE for flex fuel vehicles. So short answer is yes. Uh, mandates uh, combined with uh, market-based regulations we think are going to push, push these uh, very aggressively. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the, uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, the Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Duvall, thank you for your testimony and your time. I want to ask you a question. Um, end of page two, top of page three on your testimony, you're talking about between now and 2015, uh, you estimate that $50 billion of investment R&D is going to be necessary to develop the fuel saving technologies that we're going to need by 2015. Is that correct? Right. That's the uh, that's the cost that we've estimated on the uh, manufacturers of the rulemaking. Correct? And who is bearing that cost? Uh, the manufacturers will, will bear those costs. The manufacturers. So that is all private sector dollars that uh, they are putting in to bring a better product to the American marketplace. Yes. That under the rule, that is the requirement. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to be certain we had that clarification on on the record. Okay. So. Um, now, as we look at the opportunities for our um, those that are Americans working in the auto industry, and in my district we've talked about Nissan. We also have some wonderful folks with the Saturn GM plant that is in Spring Hill. We have some great innovators that are with Bodine that are working with Toyota. So the auto industry is very important to Tennessee. So let's talk about trade for just a minute. And are we going to see with our next generation vehicles, do you anticipate, are we going to see any trade barriers with our electric vehicles and things that we, we're going to be trying to move into the global marketplace? Uh, I would have to, uh, any sort of policy questions related to trade, I'd have to refer to the, uh, the U.S. Trade Rep, but I, I will say it's been a strong push in the administration to reduce technology barriers, particularly uh, uh, in the environmental and climate change area. This has been one of our huge strategies in international negotiations to try to get other countries to reduce uh, uh, tariffs uh, on environmentally friendly technologies. Uh, we've had some success, but uh, I would expect that to continue uh, with, with the next administration too, hopefully. Well, and we appreciate the work that's also been done on the intellectual property protections that are also a component of that. Uh, looking at the electric vehicles and considering that these will be a significant part of our U.S. fleet, 
Uh, why don't you talk for a minute about the cost and in the improvements that are going to be needed for charging batteries, what we're going to have, the burden on the grid for both at home and uh, as people are away and traveling and trying to use these for longer distances. Can you touch on that for me? Yes, yeah, so this is an area, obviously, that the Department of Energy is, is probably the uh, expert witness uh, to talk about. Uh, uh, I will simply say that clearly the current battery technologies uh, have not been sufficient to obviously allow the significant penetration of plug-in hybrids. There are some signs, obviously, that that's changing. And certainly, as the marketplace gets more competitive, we would expect prices and the quality of these batteries, uh, to, uh, prices to come down and the quality of these batteries to come up. Uh, as far as the literature I've read and talked to with other folks in the administration, I think there's a lot of optimism that the balancing of the grid, certainly off-peak charging, basically, uh, uh, could be a, a mechanism to ensure the stability of the electricity grid. Uh, but I, I would not want to go further in my testimony uh, to opine on, on that. All right. And then how long do you think it's going to be at what what year do you expect to see these electric vehicles coming into the marketplace? Uh, <laughs> I guess I would say to that question, uh, is if fuel prices remain high, uh, I would expect the uh, within the next uh, few years you'd start to get a, a, a stronger penetration of certain vehicles. Uh, but we, are, as the chairman noted, we are still some period away, I think, from a meaningful uh, percentage of the auto fleet in the United States shifting to that. Uh, the key thing at this point in time, as I said, is, is battery reliability uh, and durability uh, as well as cost. Uh, and hopefully the private sector, uh, as was noted, is starting to invest heavily in this. Uh, and that, that's a great leading indicator of the optimism in the private sector for these technologies. So uh, I guess cautious optimism would be the way I would assess that. Well, and I, I will tell you, visiting with some of the innovators that are in my district that are working on the battery technologies and working on some of the different engineering applications for next generation vehicles, I think it behooves us in Congress to pay attention to what is going to happen with the power grid, what, how we're going to handle our electric uh, generation sources, and to start to uh, be a little uh, give a little bit more forethought, if you will, than has been seen over the past 30 years as we look at fossil fuels and the application of that to the transportation fuels market. Uh, I will yield the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. <coughs> General Lady's time has expired. General Lady's uh, time has expired, um, and the chair will now um, recognize himself for a round of questions. Um, Mr. DeVal, uh, first of all, um, I do want to commend you and your staff at NHTSA for taking a comprehensive approach to implementing the fuel economy provisions of the energy bill and making many solid updates to the model you used to calculate the standards. Um, but let me ask you the first question. Um, do you think that it is reasonable to really predict that it's going that it's going to average two dollars and forty two cents a gallon for gasoline in 2016. Uh, uh Chair, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, as was uh, stated previously, I, I think it, we take the best estimates we have and we use the, the best experts uh, that we have available to us. In our view, the EIA uh, is among the, the leaders uh, and most accurate forecasters. They have been uh, wrong on the upside and wrong on the downside in, in previous years. Uh, there's little question, obviously, given current fuel prices, uh, that we are in a very volatile uh, environment right now. The proposal is a long-term proposal. Uh, uh, if I knew what oil prices would be in 2015, I would probably be in a bit a different job than I'm in now. Uh, I think we have a lot of uncertainty. We use the best information we have. I, I will say a number of other experts who are predicting extremely high oil prices in the short term have also predicted significant declines in those prices in the longer term. Uh, I know several analysts on Wall Street have predicted, you know, $150, $200. Oh, I appreciate that. But I, I'm, see, here's the thing. You have the job. You are responsible. You personally are responsible for preparing our country for uh, the oil and transportation uh, uh, status of our country uh, five and ten years from now. So it is on your shoulders. And uh, because you are the responsible person, uh, the question is, do you think it is prudent for our country as a plan to assume that the price of gasoline is going to be $2.42 a gallon in 2016 for planning purposes. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, before I answer, I would say, uh, obviously, there are a lot of people responsible for uh, we're, we're, uh, setting. You're uh, the guy that you're, I asked the Bush administration to send us the guy. The you're guy. the guy. So you're the person responsible. Do you I'm the think guy. It, you think it's responsible? My wife you, doesn't think I'm the guy. But, uh, well, uh, that, that's uh, a, uh, today's my 20th uh, okay. uh, anniversary, yeah. okay? And if I'm not home tonight, I won't be the guy either, right. okay? But that's a, that's, that's a different. Good for me, by the way. That's a different situation for both of us, okay? But for the purposes of this conversation, yeah. I'm the guy okay. from the Congress, and you're the guy <laughs> from the Bush administration. Right. So, as the guy from the Bush administration representing President Bush and Vice President Cheney, do you believe that President Bush and Vice President Cheney uh, actually believed that two dollars and forty-two cents a gallon? is what the American people are going to be paying for gasoline in 2016. Uh, I think that, uh, first of all, I'm proud to be here representing both President Bush and Vice President Cheney, but I think that uh, basically all in the administration believe that the EIA uh, is among the best and most confident forecasters of oil prices in the world, and that in the face of extreme uncertainty about future oil prices, that uh, obviously oil markets themselves uh, have been proven to be incorrect. All right, in now you have a high, pr you have a high price scenario as well. That is a high price scenario that predicts three dollars and fourteen cents a gallon by twenty sixteen. Correct. We are taking in your comment. opinion, in your opinion, do you think that that would be a better um, a planning uh, point for the American people? You are supposed to protect the American people from becoming excessively dependent upon imported right. oil. That's your principal responsibility. Uh, uh, do you think we should plan for two uh, 42 in planning the mileage for vehicles that we drive in America, or 316 a gallon by 2016. Which would you well, use, Mr. Well, Mr. Develop? Chairman, the uh, brilliance of the rulemaking process is that we uh, propose something, and then the public tells us what they think about the proposal, and then we take public comment and input uh, and finalize the proposal. So we are in the, the phase where we're taking comments, uh, yours among well, others. Which would you, as the expert, you're President Bush's expert on the issue, would you use 246 a gallon for 2016 or $3.14 a gallon? Which uh, would you use as the expert for our country? I will uh, not prejudge the rulemaking process. It's, a, it's a very important, and I, I, not to make light of this, it's very important that we. Oh, no, you can't make light of this well, here. Well, I'm not making light of it. We're what's, in a crisis what's, what's, in America. Yeah, we absolutely. We, we, the airline we, industry is collapsing, yeah. Mr. Deval. Okay. The trucking industry is collapsing. The American people are being tipped upside down at the gasoline pump every single day. President Bush sends his expert to testify before the Energy Independence Committee, and, and you are telling me you don't have a view on whether we should be planning for $2.42 a gallon gasoline or $3.14 a gasoline in terms of what we are going to tell the auto industry to build in as efficiencies in these vehicles in the years ahead. And the so this is, you are at a critical point here because the next panel is going to be talking about electric vehicles and other new technologies. Now, I personally believe that the American people will embrace them if we put in place the kind of rulemaking that will incentivize all these auto manufacturers to move in that direction. But you are the one, and President Bush is the one, who has to make the decision as to whether or not um, we are going to be basing it upon a realistic or a dream world of assessment of what the price of oil yeah, is going to be. Well, I guess I would say we don't, uh, this is a proposal, we are taking comments, and if the comments uh, uh, are sufficient to uh, inform the uh, final rulemaking to change the uh, proposal, I would not call the experts at the Department of Energy dreamers. Uh, I believe they know uh, what they are doing and are among the uh, leading experts in the world in this area. They are consistent with other forecasts uh, with respect to this. The Department of Energy, in fact, is on the high side of other forecasts, uh, not deviating substantially uh, either from long-term uh, market projections or uh, right, well, from Mr. Caruso, Mr. Caruso from the Energy Information Agency said in testimony before our committee just two weeks ago, um, but we are on the higher side of that price path right now. If you would ask me today what I would use, I would use the higher price, says Mr. Caruso from the Department of Energy. So if the Department of Energy is saying to you at the Department of Transportation, I would use the higher price, what weight are you going to place upon that? Uh, as opposed to some testimony you might get from the oil industry or the gas industry right. or the automotive industry. How much are you going to rely upon the your own Department of Energy? Or is it just going to be ignored by President Bush, by uh, Vice President uh, Cheney? 
Uh, and as every other warning has been ignored over the last uh, decade in terms of what our planning should be. We, and by we, the way, I didn't even toss in there that you know, the SUV marketplace has collapsed. The, all of this planning was based upon a faulty premise, even though we were going up a percent and a half every single year in imported oil in our country. We have gone up from 46 percent in 1995 to 61 percent today in imported oil. So it just seems to me that there is an inexorable increase in the amount of oil we are importing and as a result an inexorable decline in the control we have over the price uh, because it is more and more set by the countries that have two-thirds of the oil in the world, OPEC, right. and that we should plan for that as a national security uh, reason. So you, you see this testimony now by your Department of uh, Energy. So again, he felt free to be able to say, I would go on the higher side. We, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we are in an open rulemaking, and the, the comments made by the, uh, the Department of Energy, anybody at the Department of Energy, uh, will be taken into account and given significant weight in the decision process. I will say, uh, simultaneously, you have numerous uh, members uh, uh, and other commentators who are also arguing that the high prices are driven by speculation. Now, I don't know what the price of oil will be in 2015. Uh, we rely on experts to do that, but I can assure you it is an internally inconsistent argument to, on the one hand, claim that speculation is driving high oil prices that fundamentally should be lower, and on the other hand, claiming that uh, oil price uh, forecast should be higher. I will tell you one higher. thing that will just drive a stake into the heart of speculation in, uh, in the uh, oil marketplace if you announced that the standard is 35 miles per gallon by 2016. You are right. They will say, oh, my goodness, people are going to move to electric vehicles. People are going to move to hybrids. People are going to move to biofuels. You know, maybe the price of oil will finally come down. But why don't we plan for that? Why don't we take the offensive? Why don't we, rather than speculating on some low, unbelievably low price of gasoline in 2016 and 2030. Why don't we as a nation, why don't you as the person responsible for it, plan for a higher price? And if we get a lower price, everybody will be happy driving around with lower price gasoline. But let us at least be in control. Right now, we are on our hands and knees watching the President and Vice President go over and begging the Saudi Arabians to please produce more oil. What a sad state of affairs for our country. When President Kennedy was faced with that from Khrushchev, with Sputnik floating around in outer space, he told Khrushchev we were going to put a man on the moon in eight years, invent new metals, new forms of propulsion. And eight years later, we did it. We were going to control the skies. Why don't we make the announcement that we are going to assume there is going to be a high price of oil, we are going to assume in the same way that President Kennedy assumed the Russians would control the skies, but we are going to do something about it. Why don't we announce that it is going to be 35 miles per gallon because we are going to assume the worst. And then if the best turns out, then it is an extra bonus for America because we have the technology plus we have the lower energy prices. Well, Why don't we think that way rather than this mess that the Bush administration has allowed us to get in because we put 70 percent of the oil we consume in gasoline tanks. So if we keep assuming that where we put 70 percent of the oil, gasoline tanks, is going to be low, then of course we are going to be playing right into the hands of the countries that have two-thirds of the oil in the world. They will well, be setting the agenda. Well, Mr. So, Chair Mr. Chairman, I guess I would say that if you assume the worst, uh, worst and are wrong, uh, the economic costs are significant uh, in terms of lost jobs uh, to the United States economy. Uh, we, we need to rely on experts scientific experts. Uh, we are not, not going to have any jobs left in the auto industry. Do you understand? We are, we have seen such a precipitous drop. General Motors just announced another 19,000 jobs are taken the bio. Ford the same way. Uh, Mr. Mullally at Ford Motor just announced last week that we have moved permanently off of the SUV and on to the smaller vehicle model. I mean, so all of this is happening, okay? And, 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 and the losses have already been absorbed. And there's more to go, but we're down to a very small handful of jobs left in America and people making automobiles. I think General Motors is down to like 50 or 60,000 people making automobiles. So Starbucks has 125,000 people making latte, and General Motors has this. I mean, it's just a, it's all a sad story. And to say we're not going to set the standards higher because we're going to lose jobs, well, that's why we've lost jobs. We have lost jobs because there has been an assumption that the price of oil was going to stay at these unrealistically low levels. And people, uh, and, and meanwhile, we were driving deeper and deeper and deeper into this hole. 
So again, I say to you, Mr. DeVos, that the EIA told us two weeks ago that we should use the high estimate. Okay? Now, at least they are now thinking in national security terms. At least they are now thinking in terms of energy independence terms. Okay? But it is about time the Department of Transportation thought that way, too, ignoring it and pretending that you are protecting the uh, uh, jobs, protecting you know, tell, the, tell the airline industry you are protecting their jobs. Tell the, you know, tell the truckers you have been protecting their jobs. Tell the workers in all these auto factories you have protected their jobs by using the, the mid and the low estimates for what the price of oil was going to be. You didn't protect anybody. We have already lost. We have already lost a million jobs or more in America because of the wrong estimates. Okay? The only way we are going to get the new jobs is if we create the new technologies. And that has not happened yet. Okay? So that is your responsibility. And it is about time that we had an administration. Maybe this will be the, the going away present that the administration gives to the American people, that there is really a man in the moon plan here, that there will be a, a commitment that is made to this um, that actually can be looked back at as a legacy um, that we ch technologically challenge the Saudi Arabians. But the, you know the sad thing is, Mr. DeVille? It is that on the day the President was there begging the, the um, Saudi Arabians to produce more oil, they said they will think about it. But we want you, Mr. President, to sell us nuclear power plants here in Saudi Arabia. And he and Condoleezza Rice agreed to do that. Now, how much more volatile a region of the country can we ha of the world can we have than Saudi Arabia to be selling nuclear power plants? That is how that's how pathetic our relationship is now with these volatile Middle Eastern countries who sell us uh, oil. And it seems to me that if the President and the Secretary of State had looked up into the sky, they would have seen a broiling sun on a desert and said, no, we will sell you solar technology. We will partner with you in a new technological revolution, but we are not going to be selling you nuclear technology. You have the most oil, the most gas, the most, uh, the most solar. And by the way, I remember Peter O'Toole is being kind of windblown in some of those scenes in Lawrence of Arabia. A lot of wind there, too. We shouldn't be sending nuclear power. We shouldn't be sending all these nuclear materials into the Middle East. It makes no sense whatsoever. That's how sad our state of affairs are. So rather than have that occur oh, year after year, again, I say to you uh, at the Department of Transportation, this is a geopolitical, um, it is a defense, it is an energy, it is an economic, it is an environmental, but it is a moral issue as well that we finally stand up and say we are going to challenge um, OPEC, that we are technologically going to take them on. We have yet to make that announcement. And that would be the John F. Kennedy moment with Khrushchev for the Bush administration. And if they don't do it, then they will have missed their one great opportunity during their eight years to have sent a signal to the rest of the world that we are going to use our technological genius to solve this problem. Let me turn and recognize once again the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I concur with your remarks about the, uh, uh, the sale of uh, or transfer of nuclear materials and technology to Saudi Arabia, which, uh, as we remember, is in a part of the world where other countries have taken supposedly peaceful uh, nuclear programs and diverted materials uh, to a bomb program, Iran being the one that we are talking about most recently. Uh, but every case of a country uh, uh, going from the non-nuclear to the nuclear club, it seems to be uh, they started out with a peaceful nuclear weapons program and then diverted it. And in this case, it would be the Sunni bomb to counteract what they see coming as the Shia bomb uh, in Iran. And I, I think it is um, naive uh, for the Secretary of Energy to state, as he did before this panel, that, well, the President trusts the King. And that is why he is not as worried about it as you are, Mr. Chairman. But anyway, uh, I had another question uh, regarding. Uh, Regarding battery technology that I wanted to ask, and then uh, that's that's it for me for today. But I, but uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, are there any significant technological obstacles to setting up the kind of battery switching that some witnesses have described, or that uh, Israel, for instance, has a company that's involved in developing a, a car that'll run uh, on electricity, and then rather than charging the battery, they'll just exchange it, pull into a gas station, and take the battery out and put another one in and hook the wires up and away you go in a few seconds as opposed to however long it takes to fill a tank or to charge a battery. Um, what are the uh, obstacles technologically? What would be the most effective way for us in government to help make these stations as ubiqui ubiquitous 
as gas stations. Um, I'm going to defer to Steve on the, the technology you know, impediments question. Uh, I think he's got more to, to add to that than I do. I, I will say as a policy matter, um, clearly the regulation we're pursuing here, uh, one of the key purposes, uh, uh, I think contrary to the Chairman's comments, is to really drive the, t the technology. This is the most aggressive rulemaking that's ever been done by our department. Uh, the costs, as we said, are enormous. But one of the benefits of this, thing, of this proposal will be to drive technology uh, on a technology neutral way. And I, I think one of the key policies that we need to be careful about at the federal level is that we are cherry picking various technological outcomes. The, the history of energy policy and transportation policy has been the government has done a fairly uh, mediocre job, let's just say, picking technology winners. And what you want to do is create the right market incentives for the private sector and, pri and venture capitalists to come in and develop these technologies and to push the breakthroughs. Uh, now, as a regulatory matter, this is a regulation, that, uh, as I said, that imposes huge costs and a mandate, but it's done under a construct that recognizes manufacturer flexibility to deploy technologies in a, in a neutral way or a cost beneficial way for them. We have a very diverse car industry. I don't think it's well understood how diversified this industry is right now. So we, we need to be very careful about specific technology mandates. But as far as the current technological impediments. I defer to Steve on that. Thank you, Mr. Congressman. The battery is the single item that is the expensive and desirable thing on those vehicles. The older battery systems had very limited range, and so they had very limited appeal to people. One approach for getting around that could be the approach you suggested where you have a battery station every 15 miles. But in the U.S., the people who are now developing batteries are aiming for a range of about 100 miles so that people can commute roughly 50 miles to do it because that represents where we live and where we work now. In Israel, that's what they're aiming at also, I believe. Yes. So those really are the things that we are looking at right now. If we can get to 100 miles as the range, then we don't really need the refilling stations everywhere. You, if, you tra if you get a battery that does that, then trading it out, you're giving up a very expensive thing and you're imposing a either large cost or you need some sort of bond to make sure you get the battery back. Um, a deposit. <laughs> it's, it's an approach, but the, for the most part in the market right now, trading out the battery isn't something that looks like a viable model, but we could consider it. Well, thank you. I, I just wanted to remark that uh, in the Chairman's District, uh, A123 and their subsidiary, High Motion, are making an upgrade, as many of you probably know, for the Prius, and they so busy making them because there's so much demand, uh, it doubles the effective mileage of the Prius uh, that they have postponed making the one for my car, the Mercury Mariner Hybrid, Mercury Mariner Hybrid, which uh, I read the other day is uh, the most, uh, the fastest car uh, to recoup the difference between the cost of the hybrid version and the non-hybrid version. So I'm glad I made uh, a good choice without knowing that in advance. Uh, <laughs> But I would yeah. really like to be able to upgrade it. And uh, the city of Chicago has a fleet, I understand, of uh, escape, Ford Escape hybrids that they are converting to plug-in hybrids. So somebody is developing batteries with deeper capacity to do this. And uh, maybe Ch Chicago can come here and tell us how they're doing it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hall, very much. And uh, I'm just going to conclude by uh, saying this. Um, in 1957, the Soviet Union had launched the first satellite into space, the Sputnik. In 1961, the Soviets sent the first man into space, Yuri Gagarin. It was a very important moment when I was a boy in the United States. Since the same rocket technologies that enabled these achievements could also be applied to building nuclear missiles that could be launched against the United States, losing the space race with the Soviets was clearly unacceptable. President Kennedy responded to this challenge by calling on the nation to send a man to the moon and return him safely to Earth before 1970. He said, and I quote, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do other things not because they are easy, but because they are hard, 
because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one that we are unwilling to postpone, and one that we intend to win. How hard was this going to be? President Kennedy said it would require us to send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of a football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then to return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that of the temperature of the sun. He concluded by saying, to do all this, and to do it right, and to do it first, before this decade is out, then we must be bold. Eight years later, Neil Armstrong became the first man to stand on the surface of the moon. Today we have another great political and technological challenge. It is the challenge posed by our addiction to imported oil and the danger of global warming. In order to make ourselves energy independent and stop producing the greenhouse gases that threaten to heat up our planet, we must take on these challenges, challenges that are hard but which will organize and measure the best of our skills and our energies. But we are not talking about putting a man on the moon. We are talking about new batteries. We are not talking about rocket science. We are talking about auto mechanics. We can do this, and we can do it in a way that sends a very strong technological signal to OPEC and to the rest of the world that we do not intend to be dominated politically and economically by powers halfway around the world. That is sadly where we are today. That is where President Bush and Condoleezza Rice were four weeks ago when the Saudi Arabians said that they will send us a little more oil if we start selling them nuclear power plants. It is not a position that any American can be proud of. Your department, sir, has responsibility for setting the challenge ahead. Do not use the lowest standard. Use the highest. America will respond. We know that we are in a crisis and we want a way out, but we need to hear the words from the highest level. And I think our industries will respond and the American people will as well. So we thank you for testifying here today with us. Uh, after your rulemaking is completed, we expect you to come back here and we will uh, talk to you again about the decisions that you have made. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, if the other witnesses can come up and sit at the table, uh, I would uh, appreciate it. We welcome our uh, second panel, and uh, uh, we uh, first will recognize uh, Dominique uh, Thorman, who is the Senior Vice President of Administration and Finance of Nissan North America, 
where he oversees all finance, legal, and business operations. He also serves as the Chief Financial Officer and Senior fin uh, Vice President of Nissan uh, Europe. Uh, we welcome you, sir, whenever you are ready. Please begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I thank you for this opportunity to appear today uh, to present Nissan's views on gasoline prices and fuel economy and how it relates to energy independence and global warming. At Nissan, we have a culture of establishing very challenging yet achievable goals. Mr. Chairman, I believe you would understand that culture well. You have asked me to address three significant and complex issues and to do so in five minutes. So here I go. In our most recent business plan that we announced last April, we put forward three commitments that we want to achieve by 2012. One of them is to lead the automotive industry in zero emission vehicles worldwide. Central to that commitment is our investment in the electric vehicle. If ever there was an industry where the word globalization was meaningful, that would be the automotive industry. Growth in car sales is occurring virtually in virtually every country across all continents. This is a new and recent development. The desire for mobility is universal. In the United States, there are 800 cars per thousand inhabitants, 600 in Western Europe and Japan. But the same ratio in China and India reveals fewer than 50 vehicles per thousand people. At Nissan, we have recognized the need to find a solution to cope with this apparent contradiction between the predicted global growth in car sales and energy independence and global warming. Mr. Chairman, I believe you have recognized these trends and see the issues before us are global. Coping with global warming and energy independence goes well beyond what a single company can do. It is together by collectively pooling ideas and investments from the private and public sectors that actionable, meaningful solutions will emerge. Nissan's views led us to intensify our research and development. We invested in technologies that would improve the efficiency of the internal combustion engine in all its forms. Our engineers are optimistic, and while some innovations are significant, they are not sufficient to meet the rapidly evolving needs of our customers. In the United States, in the face of rapidly escalating energy prices, consumers are shifting abruptly from trucks to crossovers, from large cars to small cars, from V8 engines to V6, and now four-cylinder engines. Fuel efficiency is at the top of consumers' concerns. Higher fuel prices coupled with environmental concerns mean consumers are more willing to consider new forms of powering vehicles. This means an interest in diesel engines, flex fuels, and biodiesels. But at Nissan, we believe that a more radical change, a breakthrough technology like the electric car, is needed. Electric vehicles will not only have zero tailpipe emissions, but they will also offer more flexibility in determining the source of energy to power them. Today, oil is the major source of energy to power a car. With electric cars, the electricity needed to charge their batteries can come from multiple sources, including, in the best of all worlds, renewable ones such as the wind, the sun, or water. Clean coal furnaces and nuclear power would also be effective in combating CO2. Electric vehicles have always been limited by their battery as its size, driving range, cost, and charge time made electric vehicles unacceptable to consumers. Nissan has been working on lithium-ion batteries since 1992, and we have created a separate company which will be responsible for the manufacture and sale of batteries. We are satisfied with our advances and believe that we have the technical visibility today to bring these vehicles to market in short order. We will bring to the market in the United States a fully electric automobile before the end of 2010. At first, the number of vehicles will be relatively small, but we plan to have a truly mass market vehicle available in the United States by 2012. These electric vehicles will be cars that consumers will be happy to drive. They will have a range that will get them comfortably to work and back home with all the comfort and features that they're used to today. They will handle highway speeds and permit drivers to comfortably merge into highway traffic. The acceleration will surprise many and make the vehicles fun to drive. As the market grows, different types and sizes of vehicles will be launched. Nissan looks forward to working with Congress, regulators, and government agencies in making this technological breakthrough reality. The electric vehicle 
will transform the value chain of our industry as we know it today. In partnership with private industry, public policy will need to address the new infrastructure requirements and will need to work together in adapting the rules that govern the use of automobiles to this new reality and create the conditions of success. Mr. Chairman, I thank you and the committee for the opportunity to testify today, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Thelman, very much. Our second uh, witness is uh, Shai uh, Agassi. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of Project Better Place, a company working directly with governments uh, to and, and the finance community, the automotive manufacturers, and technology companies to develop scalable and sustainable personal transportation uh, systems. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your leadership on this critical issue, for inviting me to testify in front of you today. I would request my uh, full written statement to be made part of the hearing Without record. Objection, it will be. Um, the electrification of the automobile is inevitable. I didn't say that. Neither did my friend here from Nissan. It's Bob Lutz of GM. And in reality, in uh, January 21, 2008, it happened in Israel. We had the first, for the first time, the CEO of Renault and Nissan standing up and saying, we will make electric cars. We'll make them fun to drive and we'll make them in high volume, enough for the entire country to switch. We had Project Better Place stand up and declare that we will put a network ahead of time of charging infrastructure across the entire country. That network of infrastructure will include 500,000 charge spots that will be put in parking lots, in, at work, at downtown before the first car shows up. It will include swap stations that enable us to swap batteries as we go through the, uh, the um, uh, freeways, and it will include scheduling software that enables us to charge these cars without needing to bring down the grid every time everybody connects to, to the grid. We also had a policy by government that decided to push this, uh, this switch, this change from oil to oil independence within less than a decade. A president who stood up and said, we will get off oil within this decade, and a policy that was put in place to actually make that happen faster than 10 years. The electric car has a secret. secret is you have to separate between the battery and the car if you want to make consumers adopt it faster. The battery is not part of the cost of the car. The battery is a consumable that is equivalent to crude oil. If you separate between the car and the battery and you put the infrastructure in place to charge, you open a menu of, of sources to generate the electricity, the energy required for that car. The battery is a consumable plus the electricity for the car get you to a price of six cents per mile. That's cheaper than the price you called absurd right now by the administration. It actually is relatively around the range of about $1.50 a gallon. Um, if you build it in the right way, you build a service company that sits in between, almost like a mobile company. Think of Verizon or Sprint for cars. That company can actually provide both the infrastructure and the cars. And as a mobile company, what we sell effectively is miles. That company can also provide rebates for the car, and as, as it happens in Israel and as it happens in other countries, the rebate structure makes the electric car so affordable that we can actually offer these cars for free to the consumer. When you offer free cars with zero emission, with zero oil to consumers, they usually go for that car. The question is how much do you put, need to put in, in the ground in order to make that infrastructure happen and how fast can it happen? And the reality of the numbers is that it costs you about $500 per car to put that infrastructure in the ground. In a sense, if we wanted to do this in the U.S., that's $100 billion of infrastructure, the equivalency of two months of oil imports would get us off the addiction. Two months of oil imports, most of which would actually go as jobs. $80 billion will go as jobs in installing the infrastructure in the ground, jobs we cannot outsource outside this country. How fast can we do this is a question of policy in the country. Denmark, which is another country that adopted this model, had put a policy that sets the price of a car, gasoline-based cars, at 180 percent tax to get off gasoline and a zero-emission car at zero. Hence, you get asked, do you want to buy a gasoline-based car at $60,000 or get an electric car pretty much close to free? And I think that if you choose $60,000, they would actually like you to leave the country. You failed the IQ test in that case. Every year we wait costs us $500 billion of oil imports and $300 billion of the wrong cars coming onto <coughs> our streets. That's $800 billion is the cost of prolonging the decision of shifting to electricity. And so the question that we have ahead of us right now is 
would we actually want to shift off cars? Do we want to put that energy to play? $100 billion of infrastructure, $500 billion of generation, solar, wind, wave, would actually get us off oil forever. The cost of one year of oil would get us off oil forever. All government has to do is let business do what it needs to do. Go back 100 years and let us do what Edison and Westinghouse did when they built the electric grid in this country. Cut away the red tape, put in the incentives to actually accelerate this plan and probably call Detroit again. I think the Congresswoman from Michigan who is not here with us right now said it correctly. We owe a debt to Detroit. 1942, the President called him up and said, please stop making cars and start making tanks. Maybe it is time the President called Detroit again and said, stop making tanks, please make the right cars. And if we did it and we put the right investment in place and we open up for businesses like Project Better Place and others to put this infrastructure in the ground, we can get the American public to drive on electricity and save our country from oil. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Agassi. And uh, next we are going to hear from Torben Holm. He is a consultant with uh, Dong Energy AS, one of the leading energy groups in the Scandinavian region. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you here today on the dual challenges of oil dependence and climate change. Move the microphone in a little <coughs> closer, yeah. please. I can do that. I am um, I'm coming from Denmark, one of the countries that were hardest hit uh, when the oil got its first set of wake-up calls uh, regarding oil dependency back in the 1970s. At that time, Denmark was almost totally dependent on imported fuel, and 94 percent of fuel consumed was oil. In order to offset the risks associated with this delicate situation, numerous programs were started. As a result, we are now in a situation where we are a net exporter of oil. We run some of the world's most efficient power plants, fueled partly by coal, partly by biomass. And we, are close to the, and we are close to 20 percent of our electricity production uh, is based on windmills. Finally, a good number of activities have been initi initiated with a view to save energy. Over the last 20 years, Denmark has achieved an increase in GDP of about 75 percent, with almost no corresponding increase in energy consumption. But within this overall positive picture, one sector, namely transportation, stands out by showing a constant growth in energy consumption and CO2 emissions. That curve has to be broken, both from an energy security point of view and in order to make sure that Denmark can meet its international climate policy obligations. And this is where Project Better Place comes into the picture. Denmark's transportation system is organized in a way that ought to be mentioned. As Shai said, we have a relatively high density of private cars, and that is in spite of a heavy car registration tax. We also have a comparatively high gasoline cost, also as a result of taxation. Both, o both owning and driving a conventional car are therefore blessings you have to share to a high degree with the rest of society. On the other hand, we are in a situation where electric vehicles are enjoying a quite beneficial tax treatment. And finally, all of the electric electrical power needed to fuel the car fleet could come from renew renewable sources. As I have mentioned, Denmark was an early mover on wind energy and has now one of the highest ratios of wind to other energy sources in the world. To put this matters these matters in correct proportions, we have estimated that one medium-sized 2 megawatt windmill can on average supply the energy needed for 3,000 cars. In can a country... You can you say that again? One medium-sized 2 megawatt windmill can on average supply the energy needed for 3,000 cars. Thank you. In a country with 5.4 million ha inhabitants and some 2 million passenger cars, the entire passenger car fleet could thereby run on electricity produced by less than se uh, 750 windmills. Say that again. It's correct. 
In a country with 5.4 million inhabitants and some 2 million passenger cars, the entire passenger car fleet could thereby run on electricity produced by less than 750 windmills. And what is the megawattage of those windmills? Two megawatt a piece. So that would be uh, uh, 750 times two? Yes. Is that yeah. what you're saying? 1.5 gigawatt. Okay. Would, would power the entire automotive fleet for how many vehicles? Two million passenger cars. Two million passenger cars. Thank On you. top of that, we have another 500,000 lorries and vans. Please continue. Wind is not always blowing. So we have also estimated that even if all the electrical charging of cars were sourced from coal-fired power plants, net CO2 emissions would still decline by half because electric motors are three to four times more efficient than either gasoline or diesel ones. However, the more wind power we have in our production mix at any given time, the higher the CO2 emissions improvement will be. An additional benefit will come from the fact that most charging will take place at night when wind power is in excess supply. This means that Denmark will be able to use wind energy that otherwise would have, be, have to be exported to neighboring countries, typically at relatively low prices. Finally, we have made calculations on what this would mean for the individual driver. Based on conservative estimates on the anticipated cost of both vehicles and batteries, the results are that consumers who migrate from, from gas to electric cars can expect to enjoy substantial savings. This is in terms of total cost of both owning and driving a car, and it comes without sacrifice of convenience and without sacrifice of driving experience. In summary, we see this project as one with very big upside potential and very little downside risks, both from a consumer and from a public perspective, and both from an energy security point of view and in relation to reduction of CO2 emissions. We therefore hope and ask for all the support we can get from everybody involved, that is, from car manufacturers to policymakers. Our contribution, on the other hand, is to roll out the necessary infrastructure, and to that, we are fully committed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll now be happy to address any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Holm, very much. And our final witness is Mr. Jeffrey Holmstead. He, holds, he heads the environmental strategy uh, section at Bracewell and Giuliani. He was the head of the uh, EPA Office of Air and Radiation from 2001 to 2005 um, during the administration of President Bush. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Great. Thank you very much for having me. As you mentioned, I am, uh, my name is Jeff Homestead. I'm a partner in the law firm of Bracewell and Giuliani, but today I'm not appearing on behalf of my firm or any of the law firm's clients. I am here in my personal capacity as a former EPA official who has spent almost 20 years working on climate change and air quality issues. I, I feel kind of like I'm, I'm on the wrong panel. I I'm not a technology expert, but I, I do know a fair amount about regulatory policy and regulatory programs. and I want to make just a few observations about that. Uh, as you well know, last year Congress passed an energy bill that will require a substantial increase in fuel economy for motor vehicles, an increase of at least 40 percent by 2020. NHTSA estimates that during the first five years that this lies in place, it will save approximately 55 billion gallons of fuel and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by uh, over 500 million metric tons. Not surprisingly, there is a significant upfront cost that must be paid to achieve these improvements. Again, it estimates that in model year 2015, new car buyers can expect to pay between about $650 and $2,000 more for a car and between about $1,000 and $1,400 more for a new light truck because of the new CAFE program. It is important to note that buyers will, will more than recover these costs through greater fuel savings. But even so, they will have to pay more upfront when they want to purchase a new car or light truck. This is the price that must be paid to achieve greater energy security and reductions in greenhouse gases. As you are all aware, the new CAFE program was extensively debated in Congress, and the final product passed with large bipartisan majorities in both houses. This law represents a careful balancing of regional and ideological differences. 
for example, the CAFE law was carefully drafted to ensure that safety would not be jeopardized by mandating an attribute-based system. This law also ensures that other economic factors such as job loss, consumer choice, and market demand would also be considered in designing and implementing a new fuel economy standard. As I understand it, compromise agreements were also reached to protect union jobs in the manufacturing sector and to extend the flex fuel credit until model year 2019. Notwithstanding the extensive debate in Congress and the compromises reached between many competing interests in order to secure passage of a new CAFE program, there are now a number of advocacy groups who argue that Congress did not intend the new CAFE program to be the final word on fuel economy. In their view, provisions added to the Clean Air Act back in the 1970s actually require a much more aggressive fuel economy program than the one that Congress designed and adopted last year. I, as someone who spent more than five years at EPA, have enormous respect for EPA officials and their ability to develop effective regulatory programs. But it seems odd to me that Congress would debate a contentious national policy issue like fuel economy for many years, reach a compromise on an approach that garners broad support, and then expect EPA to immediately develop a completely separate program which makes that compromise entirely irrelevant. Supporters of the view that EPA and California should be setting policy in this area argue that CAFE is about fuel economy and that the Clean Air Act is about emissions. But Congress certainly understood, at least by 2007, that when it comes to CO2 emissions, they are exactly the same thing. As I think you know, NHTSA is responsible for implementing the CAFE program, and how does NHTSA determine whether car companies are meeting the program's fuel economy requirements? Well, they do it by having EPA measure the CO2 emissions that come out of those cars. As a matter of basic science, there is no difference between fuel economy and CO2 emissions. You can control CO2 emissions by regulating fuel economy, or you can control fuel economy by regulating CO2 emissions. But no one should pretend that they can be viewed as two different things. I would think that most members of Congress would find it troubling to have EPA or California or both establish their own regimes for regulating fuel economy because neither EPA nor California is required to conform their programs to the CAFE system that was so carefully designed by Congress. For example, California is clearly under no legal stricture to adopt an attribute-based system as Congress commanded NHTSA to do and under the Clean Air Act. EPA does not have to balance the competing interests of fuel economy, safety, and jobs. Considering the costs of the new CAFE law, I think it is legitimate to ask if it is wise to have EPA also regulate fuel economy or in some states have California rules compete with federal rules. It just doesn't make any sense to have two separate federal agencies, NHTSA and EPA, governed under two separate statutes, the Energy Policy and Conservation Act and the Clean Air Act, regulating the exact same activity, fuel economy or CO2 emissions, which are the same things. It makes even less sense when you add a separate California program, which may then be adopted by any other state that chooses to follow it, rather than following either EPA or NHTSA. This afternoon, I simply would like to urge the members of this committee to be sure that Congress sets clear, uniform national policy and does it in a way that's sensible for the, the manufacturing sector and for American consumers. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you, Mr. Homestead. Um, Mr. Homestead, do you think that it's wise for the Department of Transportation to use $2.46 a gallon of, uh, by 2016 as a basis for what they are planning on using in their cost-benefit analysis for new vehicles by 2016? It, I am not qualified to predict fuel economy, and, and I think what you have to do is depend on people who who are the experts in this area. So I, if, if that's what EIA says the price is expected to be, then I don't know that NHTSA really has any, any choice. But again, I don't know very no, no, much about they, this. The, e, the Energy Information Agency uh, actually recommends that we use a much higher level, but that the, they, the Department of Transportation uses a mid-level, $2.46 a gallon. And uh, I don't know how much of an expert you have to be in order to predict that gasoline won't be at $2.46 a gallon uh, eight I know years from now. The, the law that was, I think, just passed today, how much is that predicted to reduce the price of a bar barrel of oil? I have heard pretty significant predictions through
through the anti-speculation bill? Something, some people are saying 50 percent. Again, I don't know about that, but I, I, well, I know there's lots of people looking at those We don't have to issues. worry about it because the President is promising to veto it. So it's, it's not anything that's actually likely to happen since the President isn't going to uh, sign it. So uh, what, what I'm saying is given all of the things that have happened, uh, doesn't it make sense to plan for the worst? And you, you, Mr. Agassi, you're working in Israel. They, they seem to be planning for the worst in Israel, that is planning for uh, a world in which oil is used as a weapon against Israel and against the uh, rest of the world. So what is their response in terms of uh, planning uh, going forward into the future? Well, the, the, the assumption in Israel is that given the uh, right infrastructure, given the right pricing, the consumer will actually make the choice to go uh, with no oil. And so I think they're planning for the best. In, in that sense, that uh, that all of us, given the opportunity to disconnect from oil and connect to electricity, we, we will choose to do the right thing. I think the American consumer will do the same. Yeah. Well, that's not an assumption, however, that it has been made inside the Bush administration. They <laughs> they don't plan for the worst, but they also, taking your comment in quotes, they also don't plan for the best. They don't they don't plan for the American people to respond to the challenge in the mm -hmm. same way that President Kennedy expected the American people to respond to the challenge to the Soviets in outer space with this uh, nuclear mm -hmm. capacity uh, attached to it. Uh, so I think that's uh, still a, a real problem in our country. So you heard uh, what Mr. Holmes said about uh, the amount of uh, wind that would have to be generated in mm -hmm. order to uh, um, uh, provide for all of the electricity for the vehicles um, in his country. Uh, and by the way, last year in the United States, uh, we um, actually installed 5,400 new megawatts of wind mm -hmm. in the United States. Now, what would 5,400 megawatts of wind mean in uh, your country, Mr. Holm, in terms of your automotive uh, industry? It's a matter of simple math. Um, Can you turn on your microphone, please? We um, 4,500 4, megawatts, that's three times the um, amount I mentioned. So it's six million cars. Six million cars yeah. could be powered. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, well, provided that you have the same wind pattern here as we have in my country. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to assume that we will <laughs> accept the challenge and uh, <laughs> we will at least be able to match your country in terms of the efficiency of our, uh, of our wind system. Um, Mr. Agassi, um, can you extrapolate that for the United States of America? What would you think might be possible here in our country looking at uh, what Mr. Holm is talking about, looking about what the Israelis are planning. What, what could happen in the United States if your vision uh, took hold? So I think if you looked at, at the U.S., um, roughly at a cost of any source, the average source, wind, solar, wave, uh, of about $2,500 per car, we would be able to install capacity that would drive that car for the next 50 years without a single molecule of CO2 coming into the atmosphere and without a single drop of oil coming into our system. In effect, if you took the U.S. and you put 200 gigawatt of generation in any source, any mix, over the next, let's say, 10 years, <coughs> 200 gigawatt being 200,000 megawatts, we would get every car in the U.S. going forever. And we could do that at a cost of about $500 billion spread over the next 10 years of which 80 percent is labor that stays in America. So we can replace oil imports with jobs at a s scope of about one year of oil imports. We could get off oil. Now, um, right now, um, President Bush is uh, threatening a veto of a bill that would extend the wind and solar and other renewable uh, tax breaks mm -hmm. that generate electricity in our country, hopefully in the years ahead. Uh, and at the same time, um, the, um, uh, the um, I hate to say this, but it's the Republicans in the Senate that blocked uh, uh, our passage just by one vote of legislation that would have established a minimal goal for new renewable electricity generation by 2020 uh, in our country. Could you comment upon that, Mr. Agassi, in terms of long-term planning and where we should be going in terms of 
um, non-polluting electricity being used by non-polluting right. uh, automobiles that the American people could rely upon? Right. I think one of the critical issues that people have to remember is that putting cars on the grid, putting cars on the road that have batteries in them creates a different uh, economic model for renewable generation. Cars park 22 hours in a day. They drive two hours in a day. When they are parked, the battery is available to absorb electricity that comes from renewable sources. And so if you have a lot of cars, if you have 200 million batteries parked most of the day, you can take a lot of electricity that comes from renewable sources, especially wind. Wind is a great example because wind blows mostly at night. And so the, the perfect appliance that matches to wind generation is a car, because a park is parked mostly at night. You put the two together, and you actually replace oil with wind. That's the only way to replace oil with wind. We talk a lot about taking oil out of the equation, putting renewable sources. If we don't put the wire, the electric wire that connects the two, we won't be able to get there. Now, when I was a boy, I worked my way through Boston College driving an ice cream truck. Mm -hmm. And so I would get the truck in the morning, fill it up with popsicles and fudgicles. But then when I got home at night, I had to plug it into the side of the house mm -hmm. right. so that I would be using the electricity overnight mm -hmm. to keep all of my um, um, fudgicles and popsicles uh, uh, very, very cold so I could sell them all day long. Mm -hmm. Now, that is essentially what the American people will be asked to do. And maybe you, Mr. Thoman, can talk about how much less expensive it is to use electricity overnight trying to, you know, as you recharge your battery, either for ice cream or uh, to drive the vehicle, rather than in the middle of the day. That is a concept I think a lot of people don't quite understand, how uh, it is less expensive if you use it when uh, most people are not, in fact, using electricity. Well, I, I think Mr. Agassi quoted, uh, quoted a number. The working assumption, um, the order of magnitude between uh, peak hours and um, off-peak rates uh, currently would be a factor. And what does that mean? I mean, for, for ordinary people, when you mean peak and off-peak hours, what does that mean in layman's terms? Day and night. Day and v night. Very simply. If you are using electricity during the day. It is expensive. And, and if, if you are asleep at night. And if you use it from night, midnight to 6 a.m. It is cheap. It is cheap. And how long would it take to charge one of these batteries? Less than you sleep at night. Less than you sleep at night. So and how much less expensive is it to use it at night rather than during the day? Well, I have numbers that would show that it would be a factor of one to seven. So it would be seven times cheaper to take electricity from the grid at night when people sleep than in the daytime when they are how, how, would, how would that be affected if the demand for nighttime goes up? Would those numbers stay roughly similar if all of a sudden there is 200, 200 million cars that are using electricity at night? A lot is going to depend. Um, I think uh, Mr. Agassi made a good point. If it comes from wind that blows at night, it is wasted energy and you can't store it anywhere. And the car serves as a sort of a reservoir. It is like mm -hmm. a big tank where you would store oil. We would, the, the, our automobile uh, becomes just a receptacle to, um, to, to store energy and it becomes available for the, for the driving needs during the day, uh, which is when most of the driving occurs. Now, predicting, of course, Right. What prices would be when? Uh, right. The, uh, you know the, the other, the but the other key factor that I think all of us are, are aware of, I'm certainly certain the chairman is, is to get the wind energy to where we need it. We're going to need a fair amount of new transmission, aren't we? Yeah. Actually, uh, one of the studies by the uh, by the administration has put out that today, without any changes to transmission, no changes to the grid, and effectively no changes to generation. We could drive 86 percent of the cars in America on zero change, zero infrastructure investment. The grid in America is actually designed for the high end peak, not for average peaks, and not for average consumption. And so we could actually, especially if you use overnight. Um, so because the transmission you could, is there overnight, you'd you could effectively, with today's infrastructure, today's grid, you could drive probably about 150 to 170 million cars, electric cars in America. Now, you would then be using coal. What we are proposing is that as you make that change, you also make the change to clean generation because you are effectively removing the usage of a $140 barrel of oil. Instead of saving the last cent on using coal, put the last cent in and use wind, use solar, use renewable sources. 
Right, but that's, that's my point about transmission. The, 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 the places where you have good wind and good solar resources are not the places where we have transmission infrastructure. We, we have 20 million cars in, uh, in California. We can put solar plants in the Mojave Desert, and you'll lose less than 3 percent in transmission of those electrons from the desert to every major metropolitan area in California. Mm -hmm. That's 10 percent of the cars. You can look at Texas. You've got a lot of wind and a lot of, uh, of sun. Um, the, the beauty of wind and sun is that usually if you have a lot of sun, you can use that, and if you don't have sun, you usually yeah, have a lot of wind, and so mm -hmm. the mix is is yeah. is very much in in place for both of them. Mm -hmm. In some places, as one of the congresswomen here uh, mentioned, they have nuclear. A nuclear plant, to put it in perspective, can drive three and a half million cars yeah. if you already built that nuclear plant. So France, as an example, could actually turn off every single car to electrons, and not need to add any single any single source of generation and drive all their cars on their nuclear plant right. infrastructure today. Well. That they have today. Yeah, so, um, Mr. Agassi, thank you um, so much. We had uh, the United States, uh, President Kennedy could rely upon uh, Werner von Braun to help him with the space program, and we can rely upon you. Thank you. Uh, to help us, you know, solve this uh, technological problem here uh, in the United States. So, Mr. Homestead is, has already stipulated that he is not a technologist. So, a lot of this depends upon the kind of the game changing aspect of technology. So if we get the regulation correct, then everything else changes, you know, in a very dramatic way. So AT&T in the year 1980 predicted we would have one million people using cell phones in the United States in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. So AT&T was off by a lot because they missed a whole bunch of other decisions that got made. Uh, from 1980 on that changed everything. And they are right. Some people would probably not walk around with something that weighed four pounds uh, and, uh, and required them to, you know, have a direct view of some, uh, you know, some cell phone tower or a satellite in order to deliver a, a message. So you have to basically have a little bit of confidence in the, in the technology. So what Mr. Agassi is saying is, and, and Mr. Thorman and Mr. Holm is saying, is that if we use the electricity that is wasted in the middle of the evening all overnight, um, we are actually taking an unused resource, we are charging the batteries, uh, and we are not affecting the grid during the day when it is needed in order to keep uh, businesses going and industries uh, churning. So then you get to, so you have that as an asset. And I think what Mr. Agassi is saying is that uh, if you move to uh, wind and solar, uh, let's just say for the sake of the discussion that the 5,400 megawatts that we installed in 2007 in the nascent uh, part of this industry, by the way, Mr. Holm, 2,500 new megawatts of wind in Texas in 2007. That would power every vehicle, all two million vehicles uh, in Denmark, huh? sure. just what it was installed in one state in one year. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously something big is happening here. And, um, and Experts predict that we'll have a minimum of 100,000 megawatts of wind mm -hmm. by the year 2016. So now let's go to and give me your analysis of this. Let's go to our first panelist again. The Department of Transportation mm -hmm. and President Bush have to make a decision about 2016 and what kind of standards we can establish for the vehicles that we drive. And we want to use that decision uh, to enhance our technological superiority to break our dependence upon imported oil, and to create more jobs mm -hmm. in our country. Uh, now, if we factor in that 100,000 new megawatts of wind will be constructed in our country, uh, most of it not used overnight, mm -hmm. give us a little vision of what might be possible in terms of the miles per gallon standard that yep. is established for the average of the vehicles in our country by that year. So I think one of the factors I would plug in is maybe instead of focusing on the number before the miles per, we focus on the gallon. Mm -hmm. If we get off the gallon, we get to infinity, which might have actually been the, the reason why Nissan called our high, high brand infinity. We, we need to get to a point where we are driving on infinity miles per gallon because we are not using any gallons whatsoever. I think that the, the assumption that we need to put in place is that oil is not going to become cheaper. It is not going to become more abundant. I don't see any new sources showing up. The, the sources that are showing up will take a long time until we drill into them. Uh, I think the, the, the reality of the number is, is pretty fixed in front of us right now. Given that number, 
we're looking at four to five dollars per gallon right now, and we're seeing that electricity, including all costs, all loaded costs, are at a dollar, dollar fifty. That means unless we suddenly find oil that we can bring out of the ground at ten dollars a gallon, electricity is here to stay. That trend line has happened. This is like trying to fight the internet by sending letters faster. It's not going to happen. Okay? We have gone to electrons. And in the transition, we're, we're sort of going between the world of physical atoms, like sending letters around, to the world of sending emails. We had this very short period in which we turned molecules into electrons, called it facts, and turned it back into molecules at the other end. That's the hybrid model. Okay? We had a hybrid model, and it's a short period of time in which hybrid models survive. But then when you get to full electrons, nobody comes back from full electrons. It doesn't happen in every industry in, in our history. We went from physical molecules to electrons. It happened in the early 20th century when we converted light. So you went from physical to electrons. We went in every industry you in went this. went from what to what? From molecules to electrons. Right. Right? Oil went to zero, historically, after it was very expensive. Oil was discovered to light up houses. It was kerosene. When, when we discovered oil, it was used mo mainly to light up houses. And then Edison and Westinghouse put lights made out of electrons in every house, and kerosene was useless, and oil became useless, and we effectively had a period in time in which oil was pouring into rivers, and nobody would put it in barrels because barrels were more expensive than oil. We have to go back to that model. Today, if we stopped using oil for cars, oil will become useless again, the price will go down below $10 a barrel, the world will be safer, we'll be independent. In the same way, we didn't have to go out and kill those whales anymore for That's their right. oil. We'll That's just right. Let them out there swimming along. That's right. You know, don't need their oil. <laughs> and, and wouldn't that be a great day? Wouldn't it be a wonderful day if the United States could say to Saudi Arabia, we don't need your oil any more than we need your sand? You can keep it all over there. It would just be a wonderful, wonderful day. So, Mr. Thorman, can you talk a little bit here about what Mr. Agassi is, is, is mentioning in terms of uh, going all electric? We'll go right through the hybrid period and then we'll, we'll hit the all electric period. What is Nissan planning? We have, um, very simply put, we're, we're planning for the ultimate state, which is the all-electric vehicle. The uh, hybrids that we know of today are a transition between the internal combustion engine and the, um, the all-electric vehicle. W one, one factor that um, you, you must remember is that the uh, requirement or that the uh, measures that have been uh, put forward by the IPCC uh, to reduce CO2 so that um, by 2050 so that we, we don't uh, 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 further uh, 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 um, uh, so, so that uh, global warming um, has a chance of, of stopping, we have to reduce current output by 80 percent, CO2 output of automobiles by 80 percent. The only way we know how to get there is by um, the, the electric vehicle. Hybrid cars will not allow you to do that. And if we put an electric car at the end of the renewable source of energy that we've just talked about, we achieve that, that goal. So you have an economic factor. You have your oil independence. And so our car, our proposition is that we solve, you, you kill two birds with one stone. We, we get off of the oil um, and the dependency on a single source of energy. And at the same time, you accomplish the second goal, which is obviously uh, critical uh, to future generations, which is to reduce CO2 and prevent global warming. And that, the electric car, um, allows you to envisage that, that sort of future. Yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of this requires us to get the policies correct in the United States. We have to create the wind power, the solar power, the algae power. We have to go right through the whole thing and make sure the wave power that we're creating the electricity. But then. Um, once we create that, this automotive technology is moving along. The batteries will follow. The, the, the vehicles will be put together. The, the system can be put in place in order to accomplish this goal. Back in 1993, basically all cell phones were analog, and it cost about 50 cents a minute. And at 50 cents a minute, we probably won't have a lot of people using uh, cell phones in the United States. But I was the chairman of the subcommittee with jurisdiction over it, and uh, I was able to move over 200 megahertz of spectrum for a third, fourth, fifth, and sixth license in every community in the United States. 
Now, those third, fourth, and fifth, sixth, and sixth licenses could not be bid on by the first two licensees that were analog, the big companies. And what did the new companies do? They all went digital. And within a couple of years, they all dropped their price down to 40 cents, 30, 20, 15, 10 cents a minute, and, and lower. And everyone said, this is great. What did the first two companies do? They moved to digital. And they started lowering their prices. So by 1996, 97, everyone's walking around with a phone because they've moved over to this better technology that's lower cost and very affordable for them. But you had to change the policy. In 1996, again, something on the Telecommunications Subcommittee, um, we were able to create a dynamic where not one home in America at that point had broadband technology. Not one home in America. So we had to change the policies so that we could create a brand new telecom world. So that it, we moved from uh, this old, again, analog world to a broadband world. Uh, once we passed the 1996 Telecommunications Act, by 2000, 2001, we're in a world of, of, um, of Googles, of Amazons, of thousands of companies whose names no one ever heard of before because broadband is going into all these people's homes. And we become a YouTube world that no one would have ever envisioned 10 years ago because now the technology is unleashed. Not that it hadn't already been invented. You know, the, the broadband had already been invented as uh, DSL in the laboratories of, of the Bell Laboratories 15, 20 years before. So here we have to get this policy right because it will turn all the economists thinking on their head because all they can use is the old models, right? But if you put the technologist in charge, and you say to them, you know, ah, now the conditions are there where I can deploy my new technology and sell it to consumers. Then everything changes much more rapidly than anyone would have ever thought. And we've seen it happen over and over and over again with technology uh, in American society. So, uh, Mr. Agassi, could you just tell us a little bit about what the Israelis said when they made their announcement about breaking their dependence upon oil and why they did it? So, so the policy they set was, was extremely simple. I mean, it was so simplistic, everybody could get it. They basically set a differential tax on buying a new car. Said a gasoline car will cost 72 percent more than the cost of making it, and an electric car will cost 10 percent tax. And then they said, if we'll see a lot of people switching to the electric car, we'll shift both prices up. But we'll keep it always 60 percent delta until 2019. So they created a visibility of 10 years out and they are basically telling people the more people will shift to electric, the more expensive it will get, but gasoline will also get expensive. Then they said we are going to create standards and we are going to force you, better place, to abide by open standards so that you can't block people from coming into this market. You can't block everybody to buy just one type of car from one maker. Open standards using plugs that are made standards by the ISO organization. Then they basically said, we're going to put regulations so that there is competition in the market, just like you said. We're going to make it so that you're, you're competing. And then they told me in the back room, we said, we hope you're very, very successful because we're going to tax you. Because the more successful you are, the more we're going to tax you. But first, we want you to be successful. Now, I think that we need to do the same thing here. You said it absolutely correctly. This is like the mobile industry. You have to come up and create yeah, a We're going to go, I think we're going to go from mobile Exxon Mobil to <laughs> mobile. Huh? And we, we're going to move from mobile to mobile. Absolutely. And if we do that, then we have a whole new era. Absolutely. I think, I think this is the, we need to do an auction and basically come up and say, we want to put this infrastructure in the ground. The auction will give you a, a build, or build or lose type of agreement, just like you said before. If you don't build this network up front, we're going to take away your right to build a network in that region, give it to number two. And then make that happen within a very short time span. If we don't have the wire connecting the grid to the parking lot, nobody will be able to plug. And so put these wires in by companies that are running very, very fast, much faster than government organizations would run. Auction it off and then tell them, when you start to make profit, we are going to tax you. Now, again, tell us why the Israelis said that they wanted to do this. What is the reason they want to do this? Well, in, in Israel it is pretty obvious. Israel is, is a transportation island surrounded by countries that have oil. Israel has no oil. I, Israel knows viscerally that getting off oil is not a question of when, it is a question of how fast can you do it. So when, when you talk to the President of Israel, President Paris, his only question is do you think you can really do it and then is there anything else in the world that could be more important? Now. From their perspective, it is a, uh, it's, it's a topic that touches on geopolitical security, 
environment, budget. Israel pays $7 billion a year to import oil. So those $7 billion disappear off the country. They don't even come back to buy anything in, in Israel. It's just $7 billion to disappear. In our country, in the U.S., we, we, we send out $50 billion a month to buy oil. It comes back to buy us. Right? So we, we sent President Bush to ask for more oil, and the next month we sent Secretary Paulson to ask to bring the money back and buy some U.S. companies with it. So we're, we're in kind of a situation today where we have to figure out, in Israel they figured out they want to get off oil as quickly as possible. I think in the U.S. we have to figure out the same model. So we are in a situation not quite like Israel. Israel has almost no oil and uh, has to import it all. Right. In the United States, we have, um, we have 2 percent of the world's oil reserves, but we consume 25 percent of the world's oil on a daily basis. Right. So that is not quite as bad as Israel, right. uh, but it is pretty bad in terms of our long-term prospects. You can't ever find 25 percent of the world's oil from 2 percent of the world's oil reserves. That is just a mathematical and geological impossibility. Sure. Now, many people, including the White House, are now saying, let's drill, drill, drill our way to energy independence. But uh, again, uh, it doesn't add up. You can never get up to that 25 percent of the oil in the world in terms of the percentage that uh, we would need in order to say we are energy independent. So uh, what you are proposing here is something that we are either going to have to do sooner or we are going to wind up doing later anyway, right. uh, because it is just a finite amount of resources that we have here in America, and there is no geologist that says all of a sudden we are going to wind up at 5 percent or 10 percent of the world's oil reserves. That is all we have, right. and it is just a geological uh, misfortune the same way Israel's is. Right. Uh, but at the same time, um, both countries have a technological capacity That's right. uh, to be able to create this independence. There is one more interesting point here, and that is if we know that it is inevitable that we are going to get off oil and get on to the electric car, we need to look at whether we want to be leaders or followers in this market. And if we follow, that means the entire supply chain, including the batteries, will probably not happen in the U.S. Now, all things remaining equal as they are right now, that supply chain will most likely migrate either to Europe, where gasoline is priced at $9 a gallon, or to China and Japan, where the expertise in building these batteries are right now. That is where most of these batteries are made right now. And so if we wait and not stimulate this industry, we are actually going to find ourselves off addiction to oil from one country and on addiction to lithium-ion batteries from a different country. And I think we are in an interesting period where if we did the right things in the U.S. and stimulated this industry so that the incentives drive the factories to Boston where, where uh, A123 is and other co com companies around this nation, we may find ourselves off the addiction completely and not getting addicted to some other uh, substance that we can't, uh, we you know, can't bring in from this country. You know, I could not agree with you uh, more. Um, you know, the, the, the Bush administration will testify before us uh, and they will say that we have the capacity to produce rockets that can be shot at 2 a.m. in the morning on a moment's notice because a Russian incoming missile is heading towards the United States and going 10,000 miles an hour in three minutes reach, hit and destroy the incoming Soviet missile in order to protect the United States of America and to say we can do that technologically. Then if you turn to the very same people and you say, do you think we can invent a way that we increase the fuel economy standards of the vehicles that we drive, they say, oh, that is not rocket science, that is auto mechanics. We can't do that. <laughs> that is almost too simple for them to try to figure out because they don't attach the same level of urgency to it. But the reality is, is that this constant increase in our addiction to oil undermines our national security, undermines our defense posture just as surely as the deployment of Soviet nuclear weapons did. Uh, the problem is, is that we are sinking deeper and deeper into the hole. So, Mr. Thorman, what do you think is a reasonable goal for Nissan in terms of it, the production of electric vehicles uh, in the years ahead without divulging any um, proprietary information for <laughs> our, your company? Our intention is not to. This is not a PR gimmick. This is this is real. Uh, this is real business. It's a it's a real um, business proposition. And uh, 
we, we will satisfy the mandates that we have in California and a number of states to have z a certain number of zero emission vehicles in 2010. Uh, 2012, we will mass market them, uh, which means that we have to come with a uh, with an object, with a with a vehicle, and a series of vehicles that will meet several different needs and different requirements in different driving circumstances. Um, so the 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 adoption, uh, the, it, depending on the speed at which consumers adopt these vehicles, uh, will depend on on how many we can sell. But we are preparing to um, we're preparing to sell many thousands of them. Uh, and, and Mr. Holm, let me ask you this: uh, Do you think that it's inevitable that the United States goes down this route, and it's no longer a question of if, but when? I would certainly hope that uh, the United States will follow this uh, this route and go electric. Um, it. Um, you had a comment before where you have a, a reference back to what happened in the mobile industry uh, here in, in, in the United States. Um, and I'd like to, to, to use that analogy a little further. Um, both the, uh, the original NMT system, which was an analog system, and the DSM system was born out of uh, relatively small economies in, in Europe. Um, and and um, we built up the mobile industry uh, significantly faster than it happened over here. Um, the difference between the mobile industry and, and what we're talking about here is that the, the small countries in Europe cannot create a market that will make the automakers um, uh, change rapidly. We need big markets to pull this. And for that reason, I would certainly hope that, that uh, the United States would, um, would, would jump on the bandwagon, bandwagon and, and um, start pulling. And Mr. Holmstead, you have heard all the testimony today from uh, these uh, technologists. Do you think we should jump on this bandwagon? It, which it certainly sounds fabulous. It has been interesting to be on this panel. I guess the, the only question I have, sort of given everything we have heard, is given the economic case for this, why do you need a government mandate? If you can do electric cars at roughly equivalent to a buck fifty a gallon, and gasoline is now four bucks a gallon, what, as, as a regulatory policy guy, I say, well, what, then what? Why do you need a more stringent cafe standard? I, I think if you I look at the you, mobile phone industry, I look at the mobile phone industry. I don't think that came about because of government mandates. It came about because of market demand. Oh no, no, not at all, not at all. It it came about because. Uh, Amongst other things, I was completely frustrated <laughs> with the fact that uh, the two incumbent companies were moving so slowly, the price was so high, the technology was so clunky that, uh, that we needed a new policy. And the only way to do it is allow the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth companies, that is Mr. Thorman, Mr. Agassi, Mr. Holm, whomever, everyone who is not AT&T, everyone who is not the big company, to come in and to start to innovate. And once that innovation happened, then you had the big change. Same thing was true with narrowband versus broadband. Uh, if you have only got Verizon and Comcast and they are dividing the market in half, then they don't have any real incentive to But, but uh, I still don't see the, how the mandate was involved. I understand oh, allowing the, well, more well, opportunities Well, the mandate, was, there was no mandate that you had to go. It was, oh, yeah, I, it, it you just had to let people open it the was competition. Basically, yeah, it was basically that I kept having hearings where everyone would say digital is the key word, and then the two cell phone companies would be saying, but we are analog and we are not changing because it is going to be too expensive to change. And it was at 50 cents a minute uh, because they divided the markets in half all across America. But once somehow or other it lowered down to 8 or 9 cents a minute uh, and they lost their entire market, they were losing their entire market to the four digital companies, somehow or other they could then afford to move over to uh, digital. So the same thing is true here, and the same thing happened in broadband. Once we reshifted the market, okay, which we did in the 1996 Telecom Act, in order to have a broad, what you have to create is a paranoia-inducing Darwinian set of market conditions. Once that happens, you can get out of the way. The innovation will happen. But as long as the the whole thing is controlled by a couple of companies, they are never going to change because the inexorable investment uh, of, uh, 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 of, of time and career already made in the old idea is a very hard thing to dislodge. 
But what you've got to get is the new players on the field. And the only way that happens uh, is if policymakers find a way to create the aperture whereby the smaller are out there and they are able to thrive. So without our help, that is policymakers, you are not going to see massive wind and solar electricity development all across the country uh, that really makes what Mr. Agassi and Mr. Thorman and what Mr. Holm are talking about affordable and something that is compatible with the global warming agenda as well that we have for our country. So you need and a CEO of an existing company doesn't have that responsibility. We, accept, we accept that. I accept the fact that Exxon, uh, I accept the fact that Chevron, all the big auto manufacturers, that's not their job. It's our job to set the national plan. So to have a national plan to back out all the oil or to cut your greenhouse gases by 80 percent, that's our job sitting here. We're the board of directors for America. So we have to set that plan. Then we say to the private sector, go and do it. All right? And here is the new playing field, and it is wide open to you, and it is going to have a lot of wind and solar and biomass. It is going to have a lot of um, uh, uh, electric, um, uh, 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 electric slash gas stations all across America that you are going to be able to switch batteries at. And then whatever happens, happens. But uh, otherwise, we will just stay right where we are and dig the hole deeper and deeper. We are in violation of the first law of holes when you are in one, stop digging. And every year we go another percent and a half deeper into this hole of imported oil dependence. So, um, so that is, after 32 years on the, uh, in Congress, that has been my experience, that if you want the technological change, if you want to move from the black rotary dial phone era that lasted 80 years, you've got to break up AT&T, because they are going to sell you a black rotary dial phone. They, they had each of us renting it for three bucks a month. My mother, let's say for 40 years times three bucks a month, 12 months a year, my mother paid 1,200 bucks for that black rotary dial phone, and she couldn't go down to another store and buy another phone that was white uh, and only cost 90 bucks, you know, because it wouldn't go into the phone jack, right? So what happened once we changed the laws so that you could do that? Well, black rotary dial phone just went away uh, in about three or four years. Everyone moved on to the new technology, but it took the government to do it. So it is just opening up new markets, and but because I, I still don't understand the role that sort of a government mandate mm -hmm. played with respect to mobile or broadband. I don't think, I don't think Congress ever mandated those. It just allowed the competition to flourish to develop those technologies. Oh, right. No, right. We, okay. we didn't I just wanted to make sure that broadband, was but you, But once we passed the 1996 Telecom Act, if you were still selling na narrowband, then you weren't going to be a company anymore. So uh, we are not going to tell Nissan or General Motors or Ford or anyone else exactly what they have to do after this. But once we make it possible uh, for this to happen, once we create a new policy, then, then it, I have every confidence that it is going to happen. In fact, my own opinion is this is the last revolution that we had the telecommunications revolution. You know, we finally broke up AT&T. We finally unleashed uh, that revolution that was sitting there with young people and technologists all across America and all across the planet. This is the same kind of revolution that is going to be unleashed. We are going to create millions of jobs. Uh, we are going to revolutionize the price of energy, the sources from which it comes. It is all out there ready to be unleashed, but we need to put the new policies on the books. Then we just have to get out of the way. But, uh, the overarching goal has to be um, to say to OPEC, you know, we're looking at you in a rearview mirror. Okay, this is just too unhealthy for our country to have aircraft carriers floating around uh, over uh, in the Middle East to protect the flow of oil coming into our country. It's just it's a very unseemly for our country to be in that situation. So it's in a national security context too. Maybe uh, think of it that way. I'm going to give each one of you a minute to a minute and a half to summarize what you want our committee to remember from your testimony uh, as we are going forward trying to put together a national energy policy in our country. We will go in reverse order. Uh, we will begin with you, Mr. Homestead. Well, I, I thank you again for allowing me to participate. And, and, and my thought is, and this conversation has been very interesting, is that we need to make sure that there is an ability for all of these technologies to compete uh, on a level playing field. But I, I do think we need to do it in a, in a, in a way that was done before, which is to remove regulatory barriers to innovation as opposed to having additional government mandates. Okay. Mr. Holm. I would uh, 
simply reflect a little bit on the fact that what you've been talking about here this afternoon is, is nothing about new inventions. It's, it's about um, knitting together uh, existing technologies in a new way in order to achieve something big. Mm -hmm. And I would certainly hope that um, your committee and, 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 and the, uh, the House and the Senate can find ways to support that development. So unlike President Kennedy, who said we had, a, we had to dis discover new alloys, new metals, new, new, uh, uh, new uh, forms of, uh, of, uh, of propelling uh, these, uh, uh, these missiles to outer space, here we don't have to invent anything. It's the all sitting the basics, there. The basics ready. are all there. Excuse me? It, the basics are all there. It's all there, all ready to go. Thank you. Mr. Agassi. Yeah, I think that, that Mr. Holm was right. We took eight years. Over the last year, eight years, we found all the science that is required to go over to electric. And I think now it's time to put it all together with, with the right policy. I think that we are here in, the, in Project Better Place. We are available to your committee. We, uh, we stand ready to, uh, to work with you and determine the right policies. Um, there has been a lot of talk about ending our addiction to oil. I think it is uh, it's time to take a model like Better Place, um, scale it to the, uh, the needs of the nation, save our environment work on our national security, um, retool Detroit, um, bring this as, a, as an opportunity to them, not as an end of Detroit, but actually as an opportunity to grow Detroit, bring more jobs back into America. And I think we can, uh, we can ensure that this would be the project of our generation, the one that we will remember forever as the one that put America back on, uh, on a leading track as technologists and economy um, will, will show will be a force in the, in the next century. Thank you, Mr. Agassi. Mr. Thorman. Well, Mr. Chairman, I would like to, first of all, thank you because representing a company that is 7 percent of the car market in the United States, um, I am very honored uh, by, the, by the trust and, uh, that you put in, in us and in our testimony today. And I would like to thank you for the words that, that you um, uh, spoke just a few minutes ago about creating the conditions of success. Um, we will do our part, and I commit to you that uh, our company is very focused on this project, and it is something that we will deliver for you. I thank you, Mr. Thorman. And, and, uh, and I agree with Mr. Agassi. This is a tremendous opportunity for the American automotive industry. Um, there is going to be a huge transition that takes place over the next 10 years. My father always said it is better to start out where you are going to be forced to wind up anyway. You know, it is a better place to be. And we are heading there. It is inevitable. It has happened in Denmark. It is happening in Israel. It is better for us to be the leaders. And by the way, I think the world wants us to be the leader, not the laggard. Uh, they want American technology. They, they want us to uh, give that leadership. And, and hopefully um, uh, we can do this in a way that creates uh, those additional millions of jobs here in America uh, that are creating these products, exporting them around the planet rather than importing them and having the jobs be overseas. I think that is going to be our great challenge, and I think our country will respond. I thank each of you for your excellent testimony today. This hearing is adjourned.